that will bring us right down to our d downtown rehabilitation update. And this week, Mr. Hoyan has brought a guest from Knelson, which we appreciate you both being here. So, Mr. Hoyan. Uh, good morning to the chair, mayor, and members. Uh, with me today is Tom Hill, construction manager with Knelson Sand and Gravel. Tom will be available for questions after the update. So, within block one, 90% of the concrete sidewalk base has been poured, with the remainder being poured today. With the completion of the sidewalk base, pedestrian traffic will resume to the front accesses. We did have some uh, gravel access a week ago, more than a week ago. The paving stone sidewalk has begun to be laid on the north side of 100th Avenue. Approximately 10% of the paving stones have been laid in block one. The north side paving stones are expected to be complete by September 30th, with the south side being completed by October 20th. The installation of streetlights within block one is a priority, and Knelson Sand and Gravel will be working with ATCO Power to have these installed shortly. The intersection of 98th Street and 100th Avenue is expected to open by the end of this week. This will relieve the adjoining streets of the detour traffic that has been going through their neighborhood. Work on the roadway in Block 2 continues with the stabilization of the roadway complete. Installation of the gravel base will begin with concrete curbs being poured. The concrete curbs are expected to be completed by September 22nd. The first two lifts of pavement on Block 2 are expected to be complete by October 7th. This pavement will include the intersection and 99th Street proper itself. So that's basically my update for today. Um, we are open to questions to Tom and myself. Excellent, thank you. Are there any questions from committee? Mayor Clayton. Thanks so much, Chair Bressy. Uh, question in regards to timing of completion and what that looks like. Uh, you know, as we know, the weather could change any moment and that in turn impacts the construction season. So uh, what are we looking like in regards to potential completion and if not, potentially completed, what does it look like for um, opening access to the businesses during the winter season? I'll defer, defer to Tom on this question, please. Great, please. Uh, thank you to the chair. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton, for the question. Uh, obviously, moving forward, our ultimate goal is to uh, push forward to get as much completed as reasonably possible this construction season. Uh, we're very optimistic that all of the main alignment concrete work will be completed as well as the asphalt surfacing as well. Uh, as Monty alluded, uh, the concrete work on Block 2 will be completed by September 22nd and paving work by October 7th. From there, it'll be all forces moving on through Block 2 with the work behind the curves through the soil cells, through the concrete hardscapes. Uh, to answer your question though, uh, we are providing a winter plan as far as ensuring that there's no granular material on site. All site is hardscaped, whether it's concrete or asphalt work, just to ensure that it's safe for the winter season. Everything's buttoned up. All businesses have their full front access as well as the vehicular parking on the street as well. Uh, the ultimate goal is to open this road as soon as reasonably possible, ensuring that it's safe for for uh, not only employees, but the pedestrians and all ratepayers. So I say we're, uh, we're gonna be diligently working to open it as soon as possible. Perfect, if I can. Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, uh, what's the reality that the landscaping won't get finished this year? Is it likely, not likely? What does that look like? Uh, thank you. Yeah, the, the landscaping is actually uh, scheduled currently for next season as far as the planting of the trees and, and the Landscaping is scheduled for the spring of 2022 at this point in time. Okay, thank you for your answers. Excellent, thank you. I saw Councillor O'Toole and then I'll go to Councillor Thiessen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked by many people how long it's going to take. Uh, I'm asking you, how do you feel the project went and were there any hiccups along the way that maybe slowed things down or is it what, it's, what it was expected? Whichever one of you wants to take that. No, I'll take it. Thank you again. Uh, thanks to the chair. Thank you for the question. Uh, obviously, a project of this magnitude and complexity, there's bound to be some, uh, some unknowns and some hiccups along the way. So a lot of the deep utilities tying into the old infrastructure, some of the unknown services, 
as well as in the intersection where you have encountered a, a low pressure gas line. Uh, so through every step of the way, there's always the project challenges, there's always the minor setbacks. Uh, we're, we're all faced this season with uh, materials and shortages, so that's always ensuring that we're ahead of the game, ensuring materials are ordered on time and far enough in advance. But uh, I feel the project has went fairly well as far as completing all of the work to the city of Grand Prairie specifications and not just rushing through it for the sake of rushing through it. Uh, it there's a high quality product that is being delivered and continually is going to be delivered throughout the remainder of the season. So, Well, I just to give you some feedback from what I've heard, uh, this is probably the best phase that we've done so far as according to contractors. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Councillor O'Toole. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Bressy, and thanks for being here today, Tom. Uh, I guess I just got a couple questions. So you mentioned uh, hopefully we'll have everything buttoned up uh, sometime in October. So the plan with the hard surfacing is temporary sidewalks uh, over the winter, and then you would, I would imagine, come back in the springtime and open up those side sidewalks to do the paving stones? Uh, absolutely, that is the plan. So we will, once we go into the official shutdown, winter shutdown, uh, we will then ensure everything is hardscaped, whether it's uh, sacrificial, concrete, or asphalt. And then yes, in the spring, come back and remove that and keep going. Uh, the main alignment of the road corridor, that will be permanent. We are extremely confident by the end of the month that we're gonna have concrete curbs and the asphalt road network completed. What I'm alluding to is the work outside of the curbs. So once we once winter officially shuts us down, uh, we anticipate to push as long as we can into the winter season, barring temperatures and frost. Uh, and at that point in time, we will have an adequate winter shutdown plan, ensuring there's, like I say, no granular materials, it's all hardscaped going into the winter season and then resume in the spring. Okay, uh, if I may. Uh, so uh, from my, I guess from history, we, we found that the paving stone portion usually takes the longest as far as uh, after we get through the digging of all the old infrastructure that's underground. Um, how long, because this is going to obviously impact our downtown businesses along 100th, again, uh, further front door access. How long do you anticipate um, the paving stones on, on I guess it's block two? Uh, that we're working on how long do you uh do you anticipate that uh the front door access is maybe limited uh to do that work in the spring uh currently obviously block one being from 100th to 99th uh, paving stones will be complete by the end of october uh, once we resume and like you say we're, we will push into november as, as long as reasonably possible once resuming in the spring of next season uh, if you use a production, if I can say 20 meters a day to complete some paving stone, and we still have 200 meters aside, we're still gonna be 40 days doing paving stones next year as well. And I do feel like that block is smaller and uh, the second block is the easier of the two. So uh, we are gonna gain efficiencies on the second block, obviously, right from the granular base to the concrete to the asphalt to the soil cells to the slab work and headers and, and the paving stones. So I feel that uh, disruptions next season will be extremely minimal and minimal. Um, so right, and I'm just gonna let Mr. Hoyan add to that. In yes, a please. <laughs> Further to that, um, the paving stones can work into the winter months. <clears throat> there is the option of hoarding, heating the sand, making sure that it's viable and so a paving stone operation can continue uh, even with snow yes okay so, so i guess thank you uh what, what is that the plan is to continue with paving stones into the winter uh or are we just going to hard surface temporary sidewalk the, the block we are definitely pushing as far as we can into the winter season. Uh, if we get hit with uh, like frost levels, obviously we, we still have to complete the headers as far as the, and the concrete flat work. Uh, if we get to that point or when we get to that point, paving stones will resume. Uh, once we have issues with freezing conditions as, and freezing material, then we're gonna have to look at shutting down, but we're not just gonna shut down for the sake of, oh, it's October, we're done. We are pushing as far into the project, into the winter season as reasonably possible. 
Okay, and just one one more question, and if anyone else has any other questions, I do have a couple more. But uh, uh, just one more question on this on this topic. Uh, with uh, so let's say the snow comes in, the frost comes in, uh, and then we have to just stop the work. Or uh, at what point in the spring do you anticipate that you would start construction again to to kick back into high gear? As soon as the frost is out of the ground and site conditions allow. So whether it's April, May, June, uh, that will be our highest. It is and remains our highest priority project. So all hands will be on deck in the spring to resume operations on that project as soon as the site conditions allow. Typically, we look at May long weekend, but we've been uh, extremely fortunate these past few years and been going through the beginning of May, typically, is what we're seeing. Okay, thank you. I'll leave for other questions if there are. Thank you. I saw Mayor Clean, but I'm going to get myself in the queue first. And just talking about this potential sacrificial concrete, uh, would it be up to a level of doorway so that wheelchairs, strollers, people with mobility issues would still be able to get in those front doors over the winter? Thank you for the question. Well, absolutely. Uh, the ultimate goal in the winter shutdown would be to ensure that the safety of uh, the pedestrian traffic is, is met and achieved. Uh, we will not walk away from the site if it's not deemed kind of to a specification or deemed unsafe. So uh, absolutely they'll have accessible wheelchair uh, and all of the above as far as accessibility going into the winter season. And then talking about the potential of looking at this going into next season, what would you anticipate in terms of closures for both road and front door access next season? We're talking 40 days of site work. Would the road be closed for that whole 40 days? Would every front door be closed those whole 40 days? Just tell me a bit of what that looks like, please. Uh, thank you. At this point in time, uh, once the road is opened, we de we 100 percent, I shouldn't say 100 percent, the, the ultimate goal is to ensure that road remains open. Uh, it may be limited to single lane traffic and then we're going to have to uh, work safely on one half of the roadway. But when we open that roadway, we do not anticipate shutting it down at that point in time. Uh, as of this week, front door access, uh, pedestrian access is kind of uh, achieved or maintained. Uh, moving into next year, the, the same thing. I don't see any issues with any disruptions to the front door access moving forward. Great. So would it still be, would it um, so my assumption, and please correct me if this assumption is wrong, is that businesses might see short disruption while it's happening right in front of their door, but you're not going to shut down the whole block for front door access, am I assuming right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Mayor Clayton. Thank you so much. A uh, question for Monty in regards to communication with the um, building owners and the, and the commercial operators downtown. Can you tell me what it's looking like right now? Is it a daily basis that we're updating the stores of the activity um, so they can plan for the busiest retail season ahead? Um, at this point in time, the uh, businesses are being updated um, basically daily by the uh, public relations person of Knelson. Um, she has the closest access to what is happening that day. Um, I usually get it secondhand, so I'm leaving it up to uh, Naomi to update the businesses as to the... Um, I have not really been updating the, the building owners at this point in time um, uh, because I feel the businesses are the, the biggest concern to know what's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess, uh, if I may, Chair Bressy, the only thought would be if there's... Um, buildings that are empty, that don't have, currently have a tenant. Uh, it would be nice to communicate with those building owners. So if they are in the process of looking at leases, moving people temporarily in for Christmas, it would be good to, for them to be able to have that information as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's interesting because we have had two businesses move in uh, currently within the downtown rehabilitation zone. Um, we don't know what's going in one. She won't tell us what business is opening <laughs> per se, but there is one going into Coffee Co. Um, they're, they're currently setting up. And uh, in another building, I'm not sure, it looks like it might be a pottery uh, establishment. So there, there is businesses opening up in within this construction zone. And That's great news. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thiessen. Uh, there we go. Uh, just last question, uh, promise, guys. Uh, so in regards to the six-week closure, uh, I know originally this project was supposed to end, uh, well, in the end of August, and so we're a bit into overtime here. Um, I guess uh, 
What do you, Tom, I guess you're, you're running the show over there. So I guess, uh, what were the challenges that, that caused this? And was it potentially uh, staffing or crew work that you could have done? Is there more around the clock that you could have done to speed this up? Or is there anything that you could have done that you learned like throughout the course of this project that maybe could have expediated its completion over into their original timeline? Cheryl, thank you. Uh, I guess there was a little bit of uh, maybe misinterpretation. The, the project was always expected to proceed through to the end of October, beginning of November. Uh, unfortunately, in the brochure that was handed out talking about the milestone dates, there was one section, I believe, phase one. Phase stage two. Stage two would allude it to an August completion, but that was specific to that work zone specifically, uh, not outside of that. And we, and we did achieve that stage two completion of the ash molten concrete in that said period. Unfortunately, uh, we had always planned for that to be the staging area and the project to go into October 31st completion date. Uh, from the original schedule, I think we've scheduled to, no to November 7th was in the original schedule for us to complete. Uh, I have learned a lot throughout this season as far as uh, staffing requirements, productivity. Uh, every day we're still learning and every day we still have struggles in the labor force finding quality people and hiring. Uh, I do not feel that this staff or this project was understaffed anytime it needed the resources, whether it was manpower or equipment, we've placed the, we've placed the adequate resources there. Uh, I just think based on the complexity of this project, things take a little bit longer than we anticipate. Uh, and especially with the number of services and, and the, the scope of the deep utility, the, the sanitary and the water lines, uh, things just took a little longer than anticipated. Okay. Mr. Hoyan. Further to that, um, with the Knelson brochure, um, the misstatement about stage two uh, being open by the end of August did lead to expectations by the business owners. Um, but in our pre-construction meeting, in our slides and everything else that we did provide, uh, we did show that area being closed for the construction. So it was a misstep or a miss uh, uh, type on that uh, brochure that did lead to the misconceptions. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen, for the answers. Excellent, is there anybody else with questions? I think the last question that I've got is with us going into next season and sacrificial concrete going down, that, that stuff's not free. Is there increased cost to taxpayers for this going over? Thank you. No, it's uh, that's a Canalson. Obviously, it's uh, it's free to Canalson. Let's put it that way. There will be no increase to the project, to the contract, or to the ratepayers or taxpayers. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And last chance for questions. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming here to give us an update today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And that brings us to item 3.2, which is Director Service Area Report, and that is Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bressy. We'll start with economic development. Uh, over the last month, the city's welcomed 27 new businesses uh, with the uh, economic development part, uh, department dropping off cards and uh, welcoming them to the city. In engineering services, uh, we have closed the aggregate crushing program request for quotes. Uh, this is for all the recycled concrete crushing that we use. Uh, 108th Street upgrades RFP. This is for the paving of 108th Street from 132nd Avenue north to the city limits up towards Whispering Ridge. Uh, for current construction with road rehabilitation, 100th Street between the northern city limits and 128th Avenue continues uh, with curbing going in yesterday or beginning to go in yesterday. Uh, the Smith subdivision, uh, currently working on deep utilities. Uh, we expect that that project will complete before the end of the year, uh, at minimum the utilities and the roadway. Uh, there is some risk that, uh, depending on whether we could see landscaping and sidewalks carry over till next year. Uh, other projects that we have going on right now are the Masquite Park pedestrian bridge project. It's anticipated to be complete by the end of October. Uh, the Mount View Stormwater Management Project, uh, Phase 1 is nearly complete and Phase 2 is uh, about to be started and is anticipated to last for a few months, so that'll continue over the winter. 
in Highland Park, the sidewalk rehabilitation project. Uh, concrete is complete. Uh, we have a few driveways and uh, some landscaping left to do, and we anticipate to be complete that within the next week or so. In transportation, uh, we've recently installed new radar speed signs at Alexander Forbes School on Poplar Drive, as well as at a playground zone on Landing Drive north of 100th Avenue. And one additional uh, set is planned for Hillcrest School on 102nd Street. The bike park construction uh, started uh, late last week. Uh, work will proceed into the end of October and we expect completion of that in June of 2022. Uh, transportation crews uh, will be starting to demolish the South Bear Creek shop uh, down on the south end with construction to start on its replacement here shortly and we expect the construction to be done by early to mid September or early to mid December. I want to thought I'll take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, Director Glavin? Councillor Plot. Guess re request to speak doesn't help. Um, thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, Director Glavin, can you just give me an update on on what kind of uptake we're getting with our dig incentives? Um, just hearing the community, some folks applying. I'm just wondering if we're actually having any successful applicants yet. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, right now, I'm not aware of a completed contract. I know that they've been working with a number of proponents that have that are interested in getting the grants, but I'm not aware of an actual uh, finalized application being submitted for that program. But that's something I'll have to check with Economic Development to confirm. Okay, if you, if you wouldn't mind, I just I guess what I'm hearing in the community, just for your for your knowledge, Director Clavin, is that um, what we thought we approved and maybe what's been approved are a little bit different, um, and it's a little bit harder to actually get some of the qualifications required to make some of the DIG programs work. So it's just some feedback I'm, I'm hearing from the development community on that one. So thanks for that. Just, I see you want to get in the queue, Councillor Tool, but I've, I've got a question about that in particular, so if it's all right with you. Um, just what is the, just hear, hearing that, Director Glavin, what is the plan for reporting back to Council or Committee with uptake of the DIG program? Do you anticipate there being a, formal report or a formal touch for uh, for the next council to review that or is that something that would have to be brought forward by us if we wanted to talk about it thank you chair Bressy. i would expect that we do it similar to what we've done for the uh, current incentive programs where we bring them back through the director's report update uh, and that we could do perhaps a yearly review of of you know what the success or uh, failure has been with that program uh, i will say that if we don't get any applications through by the end of the year we'll probably come back uh, with some information for council to suggest we might need to tweak uh, the requirements because it might not be fine-tuned enough to actually get a get something over the finish line. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, is it on this councillor plot? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Yeah. So just on that, I pre appreciate hearing that. You know, there could be a touch point for the net for the next council to talk about it. I would just maybe throw in a little bit of a caution that the earlier we can do that, the better. Knowing that proponents are looking at doing these projects for spring, lots of times. And so if we don't have an answer for them till January, February, if there's a review date that we might miss some of those opportunities. So if possible, it'd be, it may be nice a little bit earlier in, in, or later in this Q4 uh, to have that conversation. So if there were changes to be made, they'd be done in a, a little bit more timely fashion to try to spur on some development in 22. Thanks. And then I think Mayor Clayton had something on this. Yes, yes thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, Director Glavin, uh, what if any out of market advertising or promotion of the incentive program has been done? Uh, thanks, Chair Brescia. I would have to confirm with economic development exactly what they've done for out of market. Okay, thank you very much. And then Councillor O'Toole had a question. Yeah, I got uh, two questions for Mr. Garvin. Um, the bike park, uh, was that behind or was it scheduled to start when it did? Yeah, thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, so that was one that we had to go out for design for. Uh, so we, or we put out the RFP for design of the bike park. Uh, received completed design, then we had to go tender the bike park work. And initially, we didn't get any um, bidders on the initial tender when it went out. Um, so we had to go back out uh, before we got it, which put us a little bit further behind. So initially, we did expect to have that project done by the end of this year. Um, but uh, just due to uh, not having bidders on that first uh, round of tenders, we, it's going to be extended into next year. That project is funded with the ICIP money, so that is uh, good till 2023. So we're not at risk of losing any of that money the, and the city won't expend any more than we initially planned. And just one question regarding the public utility lot, which is across the street behind the senior's apartment. Uh, what's the progress on paving that for a parking lot? 
Um, that might be one I'll have to get back to you with an update on exactly what the status of that project is. Yeah, it come up to a, as a report one time they were going to pave it and then just haven't seen much action there. So the neighbors were concerned. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Bressy. Uh, thanks, Director Glavin. Uh, just a couple of updates on a couple of roads I didn't hear, and uh, I forgive me if uh, you mention it uh, as you're worrying through all the all the road work stuff. Here's about Park Road, 92nd to 96. Uh, paving for that, uh, do, do we anticipate that to be done, sidewalks and all that? Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, the utilities are first priority, and as they're the deep utilities, are the first thing that will be done on that road. Uh, that'll connect into the uh, recreation center that we're, is under construction currently. Uh, that's not at risk, so the utilities and the paving will be done this year. There is some risk based on whether uh, that the sidewalk and landscaping may ca be carried over till the spring. Okay, no, that's fine. I was mainly concerned about the utilities and uh, and the roadway for now, uh, but I see maybe Councillor Clayton or Mayor Clayton has something on it. Yeah, Mayor well, then I have one more. Eric Council Thiessen. Um, uh, just, uh, just an update. So uh, on 84th, 116th, 115th, uh, we have that big Aquaterra trunk line project going in there. Uh, have we had any word back from Aquaterra on how long that project's going to continue or if they'll be able to button that up before the end of the year here as well? Thank you, Chair Bressy. I know that we did request information. I was looking through my email earlier today and I did not see the final answer. My understanding it was going to be done by the end of this construction season, but uh, I can circulate an email with that information as soon as I have it. Great, thank you so much. So I've got Councillor O'Toole and Mayor Clayton. Yeah, Mr. Glavin, it was Diep Manor that uh, the apartment complex that I was talking about. So just to help you out in your research there. Excellent, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, uh, Chair Bressy. I know this isn't necessarily the appropriate uh, venue for this, but I will just uh, make a, a comment to Director Glavin that um, considering that we're the largest shareholder in Aquaterra, if you don't get a timely response in regards to that question, could you let me know and I'm happy to write a letter. Thanks. I did have a question though um, um, in regards to, oh, as this is our largest capital project in the city's history, um, the can you tell me approximately did, Assuming are we at 80% completion of what we forecasted, 90%? Do you have any uh, guesstimation of where we are in the overall completion of our capital plan for this year? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Uh, I would say that by the end of the year, this is a bit of a guesstimate, uh, we'll be 80 to 90% done. Uh, there will be carryover this year. Thank you for that. Excellent. Are there any other questions for Director Lavin? Excellent. Well, thank you, Director Glavin. We appreciate the report. And that brings us to item 3.3, which is development permit. I have got a conflict of interest to declare, so I'm going to get up and leave the room. And that means that Mayor, or sorry, Councillor Pallott gets to assume the chair. Thank you, Councillor Pallott. But thanks, Councillor Bressy. Uh, so we'll move on to item 3.3 in our agenda, and I'll look to Mr. Uh, Tobin to introduce us, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. the Chair. Uh, slide up there now in a second. Okay, so administration has received a development permit application for an addition of an accessory building to be used for a safe consumption services, client supports, and medical assistance as a community outreach classification of use at 10101 97A Street. Uh, in May of this year, the government confirmed that the province's mobile supervised consumption site in Grand Prairie would be discontinued and moved elsewhere in the province. Uh, you can see a little white uh, in, the, in the 2021 aerial photo. It shows typically where the van would park during a normal day up in the northeast western corner. The uh, government indicated, or at least the, me the media release indicated, that they would transition the use into the Rotary House Homeless sent Shelter. This is exactly how the ad is there in the, in the report. Discussions between the Northreach Society, who managed the operation on the ground, and Wapiti House, which is formerly Rotary House, determined that the existing building did not have the physical capacity to accommodate the proposed facility. The government did not check with uh, Rotary House first. 
With no space available in Wapiti House, Northreach submitted a proposal to the Government of Alberta requesting approval to operate their program services and supports from an echo type trailer on the existing parking lot north of Wapiti House. In July, they received confirmation of the Government of Alberta support. Uh, the subject property lot is here where the star is located in the center. It's uh, surrounded by, to the west, we have the Aberdeen Center and a parking lot. To the northwest, we have a DC-25, which is a deck control district, formerly the uh, Fletcher Building. Uh, and then we have City Hall former, uh, further to the north. We have a railway to the east and the northeast, residential further to the northeast. There's a vacant land to the east, vacant land to the south, and residential apartment building further to the southeast. The property itself was located in the Central Commercial District. Uh, as I said, there's a DC-25 district abutting it to the north, and where a community outreach facility is listed as a discretionary use. So what they're proposing was the addition of the accessory structure. Uh, if you see the site plan there, they're proposing to add a modular structure on the site and to be used as a community outreach facility. As we indicated, the site plan indicates the structure will be 20 feet, one inch by 13 feet by 10 and one eighth of an inch high with a nine foot six by 40 foot ramp. Potable water will be in a self-contained tank in the floor filled by water truck. Sanitary sewer will be self-contained tank and floor emptied by a vacuum truck. Heat propane tank proposed as the source and a power is a 60 amp plug in, into the building. The floor plan of the building itself shows two washrooms. Uh, both require sinks, so one doesn't require the sinks. That has space for staff, office, consumption, treatment, uh, you know, a waiting area, reception area. The building itself has a front elevation and a rendering of what it would look like. Uh, certainly a little bit better than a typical echo trailer, but at the same time, it is a uh, pre-structured building. Uh, if we look at the site photos, this is looking north. This is City Hall and the vacant land. We look northeast, you see the Aberdeen building and the former Fletcher building, uh, northwest rather, no, north e typically east, you'll see uh, vacant land. East again, northeast, you'll see uh, vacant land and uh, residential, which is further across the railway tracks. Uh, yeah, that, unfortunately, I couldn't get a picture of exactly where it would go. You can see the, the van, the safe, con the supervisors, supervised consumption site van. There were individuals there, and I didn't want to put them on the camera. Uh, to the south, you can see there's a stockpile, vacant land. South West is an apartment building, and looking like, you know, from the north of Aberdeen Avenue, this is the building that we're talking about. So the impact of the structure behind the building, the structure itself. Uh, it meets city's council's focus in community and safety and the value states, and you're very familiar with the result definitions, but the result definition, just to briefly say for community, delivers programs and services that meet the needs of the community and individuals by promoting healthy diversity, inclusiveness, and wellness. And the result definition in safety proactively addresses both legal and illegal substance abuse through education, regulation, and enforcement, while supporting programs which address safety and harm reduction. There are no environmental or economic impacts associated with this development. Social impact. The article in the, in the indicated that the city of Grand Prairie is facing the highest overdose fatality rate in Alberta at 5.1 per 100,000 people, compared with the a provincial average of 31.6 based on latest provincial data. And that's what the article says. It can certainly be contested uh, to the actual numbers, but there is no doubt there is a crisis. Therefore, approval of this application would provide services, supports, and medical assistance that have an impact on those at risk including services to reduce harm. The use of a community outreach facility is listed as a discretionary use in the Central Commercial District. The use is defined as, means the development operated by a government or a registered non-for-profit organization 
for the purpose of providing services for health and wellness of the community. Typical primary uses include intervention and training, community and education programs, daytime shelters, counseling services, social services, and physical and mental health services on an outpatient basis. Uh, the use may include accessory office functions. These facilities may offer limited overnight shelter. In this case, that is not what we are looking at. What we're looking at is, as I said, uh, you know, crisis intervention and training and health and community awareness. Administration is satisfied that the proposed use meets the intent of the definition for a community outreach facility and the proposed development meets all the requirements of land use by last C's. 1260. The risk. This is not a new use at the location. As I showed in this, this slide, you can see that the van is there. The use has been there over three years. However, it hasn't required a development permit because it was mobile. It was at no fixed address. Now they're asking, based on the government's request, they're moving it, they're taking it, and they put a building on this site practically where that star is. So there, the committee has some other options, including what we're going to recommend. You can refuse the development permit application. You can include a condition in the development permit requiring hookup to municipal services prior to occupancy because they are using a tank uh, for water and sewer. Uh, approve the development permit on a temporary basis for a period specified by the committee. Or approve the development permit on a temporary basis for a permit for a period specified by the committee, and if the use extends beyond the deadline, then the applicant will be required to hook up to municipal services at that time. The stakeholder engagement, a total of three notices were sent out to adjacent property owners and the Downtown Business Association were also notified. We received 13 objections to the proposal development, uh, one from an adjacent landowner. Uh, the land use pilot requires that we and, you know, that we notify the adjacent landowners. Now, what's the width of that? Some people talk about a 50-meter radius. Some people talk about 100. We use a 50. Within a 50 meter, you would not hit those residential from that use. Uh, time of writing the report, like I said, we received seven objections, or actually eight were added to the report, but we have received five more for a total of 13, and they'll be added to an amendment to the report. We've also circulated to various internal departments and external government agencies. No objections were concerned, were indicated. Uh, we did get an indication from in, uh, inspection services concerning the building and the foundation. They were concerned. So the recommendation, the application is proposed, the applicant is proposing to add a modular structure as an accessory building used to the Northeast parking lot of Wapiti House be used as a community outreach facility. The use is listed as a discretionary use in the CC district, and according to the language byline, the development officer is the approval authority. However, due to the sensitive nature of the application, administration felt it was best to present the application to the committee for the decision on the approval. Administrator is satisfied that the proposed use meets the intent of the definition and the development meets all requirements of the land use bylaw. Administration recommends to the Infrastructure and Economic Development Com Committee that development permit PL 210372 be approved for the addition of an accessory building to be used as a safe consumption services, client supports, and medical assistance as a community outreach facility classification and use at 1010197 A Street. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Tobin. I'll just look to committee here for any questions. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Pilat. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tobin. Uh, just a couple questions here. Uh, in regards to the province's decision on uh, discontinuing the mobile supervised consumption site, uh, do we know what the dates are in regards to that discontinuation? Does it start immediately or once the structure is built or uh, in the springtime? Uh, if the applicant is attending on Zoom, I would like the applicant to answer that question, if they could, from Northreach. Yes, thank you. Uh, the province's decision to move the current mobile unit is based on when we get this temporary um, 
trailer model up and running. So they're not interested in taking the mobile unit until we get another option set up. Okay. No, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Power. Um, I guess my other question is, um, I, I know that our, our overdose rates are fairly high, 55.1 out of 100,000 people, which makes it close to 100 people overdose over uh, the last year. Uh, but based off of what we know at, uh, uh, in being engaged with the, um, our opioid, community opioid task force, uh, we know that uh, most of those overdoses are happening in people's homes. Um, and uh, I, I guess my question is, uh, what is what is the use of the current uh, supervised consumption site? Do we have like many people going there every day? Do we have people from homes going there to get clean supplies? Uh, is it mainly street outreach? Um, could you just uh, maybe this is a question for Mr. Power, but uh, what is your daily usage rate uh, of the current site? So the daily usage site. So we currently see about depending on the day, from 30 to 40 individuals per day. Last year, we had two, over 200, a little over 203 unique individuals um, over the year last year. The uh, Mostly, it is not individuals using the site that use in their homes. It is the individuals who access um, Rotary House services uh, that use our current supervised consumption site. Okay, um, I'll just, I got a couple more, but uh, I'll leave for any other questions. Okay, I'll come back to you in a bit. Councillor Thiessen, Councillor Friesen, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair Platt. Um, this question I think is for the proponent. And while I'm not a voting member of this uh, committee, I, I do have some questions. Um, first, with, the mobile consumption site um, being moved out, if this development permit is, is denied today, uh, what then would happen? Like if, if there's um, no desire for this committee to approve this structure, what then? Can you tell me what the city might expect to see in, just in terms of um, does supervised consumption then um, no longer, is it no longer available in our city? And if so, what changes might we see with street level consumption? There is a chance that there wouldn't be supervised consumption services in our city. And if there wasn't supervised consumption services in our city, um, our overdose rate would be quite a bit higher than what they are now. And we would also see an increase in needle debris uh, in the city as well. Thank you. And one of the suggestions from administration is that the committee require hookup to city uh, services. Is that within the realm of immediately doable for you? And if so, at whose expense would that be? And um, if not, if it were a requirement down the road, uh, would that then be something that you could accomplish? Hooking up to the city services is something that we can accomplish. We decided not to go forward with that just for the simple fact that we wanted to keep this site as mobile as possible, even though it is a fixed structure. Um, but if it is something that's required from the city, then we are able to do that. And it is at the expense of of the SDS funder, so the so the province. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'll just before I go back to Councillor Thiessen, I'm just got a couple questions myself, please. Um, Mr. Tobin, can you let me know for for if, if a committee did today to, to wanted to take a pause on this and weren't weren't sure we had enough information to go uh, today and we had some concerns about it? Um, 
tell me how it would impact this uh, organization. Like if we didn't make a decision for say a month, would would that really change? I guess what I'm wondering is when they're wanting they're wanting to put shovel in the ground and actually start this project. Uh, they want to put the shovel on the ground ASAP. Uh, the government wants it, but as uh, indicated, they will wait till till the structure is completed to do it. Uh, so delaying it, it, you know, it will delay the project for them, and then they won't be able. Once the weather starts, they won't be able to get it started. And then I don't like. They'll have the applicant will have the answer as to what happens then uh, through the chair. I, I I'm not quite sure. Okay, and just one other question. Oh, fair enough. Um, one other question. I just I'm just wondering. Do we have any other facilities like this that we would let do off site uh, sewer and water services like we're we're talking about potentially not not forcing them to have direct into Aquaterra system? The, uh, the Aquaterra's comments came back on the application saying they do service the existing building and they can service this building at cost. There is a bylaw uh, that indicates that all buildings in the city should be serviced with municipal water and sewer. However, this is an accessory structure. So as an accessory structure on site, uh, it's not the principal building. And we look at it as, well, it may not require water and sewer. However, if the committee determines that it does, then it does. Okay, just just on that, can you give me, or, or I don't know if you're allowed to give me examples of where we would have an accessory building that's being used by the community that wouldn't have uh, regular water and sewer in it? There are plenty, uh, in the IG districts, there are plenty of buildings that have trailers that are on temporary structures that have water and sewer. Okay, and I guess, but are they used by public? No. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just go over to Councillor Thiessen again. Thank you very much, Chair Palat. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Tobin, uh, we received uh, several several objections and uh, emails that were included in the package. Uh, we sent out three notices and got 13 objections, a large part of it, especially from the Downtown Association, who's sort of a, well, they are a community partner with the City of Grand Prairie, um, uh, that they received uh, their information about uh, this project maybe two weeks later than it was dated. Um, uh, what, are, what are the issues there and um, I guess as far as getting those out in a timely manner and making people uh, aware. Yeah, through the chair, uh, the applicant, yeah, the, they were put into the mail room on the 13th. So they went out with the mail or what we anticipated they would go with the mail on the 16th as any development permit project. The complaints we got is that they didn't receive until the 23rd, which was a week after. And so we gave, so once I was notified of that, we gave them an extension of 10 extra days, I mean, they, uh, eight extra days to comment. So eight plus four is 12 and, the, and it is 10 business days. So everybody, including the Downtown Business Association, had plenty of time. I can't control the mail, Mr. Truth. Yeah, I was, that's, I was just gonna make that comment. So this is a mail issue, I guess. Uh, uh. Yeah, uh, Janice was with me, administrative assistant. We both put them in on the 13th. Friday the 13th was the application, was the time. So, you know, maybe it was because it was Friday the 13th. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. I, but, I, yeah, it went in with internal mail, and, and it got mailed out. So uh, there was no, I don't, there was no holiday. So there was no reason for the, till after the fact there was Labor Day, but that was after, way after we mailed. I'm not going to criticize our internal mail service or the postal service at all. Um, but uh, I guess uh, just a comment. Uh, w when we're talking about, uh, uh, I guess, a, a build like this um, or a change, a change of use, like from a, t well, they're both temporary structures, but this one's more fixed. Um, I think especially when we're talking about the core and the potential impact to safety, I know that we're, we're building this to improve safety in the community. But uh, that hasn't always been the case uh, throughout North America uh, as, as far as that happens. So I think uh, the more community conversation that we can have, and especially with our downtown businesses and, and even the residential neighborhoods that are abutting on the back, I think uh, in, in cases like this, we should go above and beyond to inform as quickly as possible and uh, to get as much feedback as possible and maybe in, in this realm, even expand uh, beyond what we normally have to when it comes to informing people of the development. Um, just because uh, this can be contentious and uh, there there could be solutions that, that could help and uh, when people sort of get something dropped on them, whether it's the mail or not, I think they're, you know, they're, they're getting pretty upset about it and rightfully so. So just to comment on that when we're talking about big projects like this, I think as, a, as an organization, we should go above and beyond our own standards. So. But thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tobin. You're welcome. Through the chair, you're welcome. 
Any other questions for Mr. Tobin? Okay, seeing none, thank you for that. Um, I do know we have some delegates that are here to speak um, on both uh, opposed and in favor. So I'll start off with any delegates that are here to speak in favor of this application. Anybody in chambers in favor or is anybody on Zoom in favor that would like to speak to this? So I'll ask one more time, anybody on Zoom or in chambers that wants to speak in favor of this development permit application? Okay, seeing none, I will switch it and go, is anybody here opposed if they would like to speak again, uh, to this development permit application? Um, so if you wanna come up one at a time, please, and just uh, introduce yourself. Um, there is an X there, if you have anything that you wanna put down, you can put it uh, for visual, you can use that as well. And if you just introduce yourself and set your mic, that would be great. Sorry, Ms. Bosch, do you mind just moving the mic just a little closer? Thank you. Uh, my name is Wendy Bosch. I am the executive director for the Grand Prairie Downtown Association. So um, I don't think the mail entirely was the issue. Uh, we did not receive all the applications come through to me through email, and it was just missed, accidentally, a clerical error. However, when uh, I did contact the city, Mr. Tobin was very good about um, extending the um, application date for concern. So I do appreciate that. Um, we did send a letter in, in regards to asking for an extension. And, uh, and in part, this is what I did put in the letter, which is backed by our board of directors. Um, and you should hopefully all have a copy of. I would like to start with part of this letter that says, our association and membership respect all of our citizens in Grand Prairie and have supported the mobile RV safe consumption site in its current form, located by um, the Wapiti House now. We understand the value of this consumption site and appreciate the program, organization and government for recognizing the severity of these complex issues. So that needs to be said first and foremost, we've lived with this in our, in our city core for three years now. And our members have been supportive and um, feel that we all have a so social obligation for every citizen in this, in this city. Our concerns lie, however, with this permit change from a mobile on wheels unit um, to placing a building for all intents and purposes serves visually and procedurally as a permanent structure. I, I have to disagree personally, and I do know that uh, my membership would also disagree that a ATCO type trailer or an oil field type trailer that might be dressed up a little bit still is what it is. Does this fit with the rehabilitation that we have done in the core in this last six years or so, the money that city council has spent and taxpayers has spent on the revitalization of the core, does this type of structure fit with what our vision is? I, I don't see it. I don't see that this um, type of build remotely fits where our vision goes. Um, most cities, uh, many, large or small, are, are working on revitalization of the core. The intent of that is to bring back people to the core, uh, citizens, patrons, families. Um, it is also to bring back some sort of increased um, assessment value to businesses and property. Um, we comply with, you know, with the safe community aspect we have for the last three years with this consumption site. It, we all need a positive quality of life. Not, nobody's arguing that. Um, but we do have concerns on this type of build being thrown up um, just so quickly with there's no thought process to what happens in the future. Is there gonna be more pods added, added to this? What will it look like in the future? And once this development permit goes through, 
is there any way to change that trajectory of those type of buildings coming into the core? I don't believe it fits, nor does my membership believe it fits in what our um, dynamics of our revitalization is, is in purpose for. Um, let me see my notes here, excuse me. The point of this being considered an accessory building um, is a concern and Barristone Associates is also here uh, as, as well as Landsman. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, quote a, a small part of it. Um, as an accessory building, the, the primary building is uh, Wapiti House. So the purpose of this build or somewhat placement of this unit is in contradictory um, model to what Wapiti House runs. So how, if, if you're not allowed to have any type of consumption of, of illegal drugs or alcohol, how do, you, how do you put an accessory building with a building that doesn't permit that? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, as well as, you know, tanks. I, I don't even understand that. This is not a, um, a park or a lake site where you have tanks um, under a building to, to show as, as a permanent structure. Now, I know everybody says it's not a permanent structure, it will be run as one and potentially added to. Um, there is another quote I'd like to uh, go to on the Barristow letter, and they will go into more in depth in this. Uh, the main reasons that the land use bylaws exist is to allow landowners to le legally do whatever is permitted on their land while reducing the negative impacts to everyone else. So. You know, there are some great judges out there. And yes, they go to the letter of the law, but they also go to the spirit of the law. So are we following both when we are talking about just the letter of the law? I think we have to look at the spirit of the law as a long-term investment into the core. Is this the right placement? Is this the right um, site? for buildings like that, I don't, I don't believe it is, and I don't think my membership believes it is. You know, um, I, I would like to see some more thought process put into this plan. Um, and, you know, it, it's not that we're against helping people. That is not, not advantageous to anybody. Um, but we do like to see something that has a purpose, that has, shares the same vision as where we are going with um, the city center. Right? You didn't spend millions of dollars to throw some holiday trailer in, in with tanks to um, you know, appease the provincial government. That's, um, any questions? Thanks, Ms. Bosch. Thanks for asking the question for me. Is there any questions from committee? Uh, Councilor Friesland, please. Thank you. Thanks for coming in and speaking so eloquently to this. Um, what I am hearing, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, or let me just ask outright, would it, would, would it be more uh, amenable to your membership if rather we put in a permanent purpose-built structure for supervised consumption? I think for in, in or around, um, you know, not necessarily right on that property, but in and around the the area of Rotary House. I do think that the intent of this originally, as a mobile unit, was to address uh, the population base that needed it the most, and wherever that may be within the city. We do have to really understand the the people who have spent. Uh, millions of dollars in and around for businesses, property. Once you put a permanent structure, you do have to look at assessment rates. You do have to look at um, uh, vacancy rates 
chances are they'll, the vacancy has already been going up in the area. Will this putting a permanent structure increase that? There is no way to be known, but if you look at any of the other cities who have had to deal with uh, this type of structure nearby, vacancy rates do go up and lease rates do go down. So, you know, as a, a business association, we do have to be cognizant of both sides, both the business side and the social side. Thank you. So if this committee decided not to approve the development permit and instead um, insisted that the mobile unit stay, how would that sit with your membership? That would sit. I think it sat for three years and I think there was no um, upheaval of business persons or um, landowners that, that fought against any of this. That, that's not the issue. Um, I think it needs to stay as a mobile unit and on wheels. And if need be, the city also has, and Northreach, has that adaptability to move it wherever they may need to. Because that, we're not just talking about right now. And that's why I brought up, will there be another pod and another pod? You know, like, you do have to think, think ahead in something like this. As the city grows, our social issues often um, somewhat come up with that. I, 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 have, I struggle with uh, the potential of them taking it away and not having anything here. If we're rated number one and two off and on, bouncing back and forth within Alberta for, for overdoses, um, that would be a huge mistake on the provincial government, and I, I really don't see that as an issue. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Bosch? Just one for me, uh, Wendy. Just wondering, you'd mentioned about um, the lower vacancy, the lower valuation of properties. Have you guys been able to work with administration to actually get a study or some analysis on what the impact has been with, with uh, I guess, Wapiti House and the consumption site in the last three to five years? I don't have any data on that other than um, conversations with the membership okay. and, um, you know, life, life uh, stories that, that base that, you know, they're not, they're not having the um, businesses come in, their lease rates have gone down, their vacancy has gone up. Um, it's a problem. And, and so can you maybe just for, for my knowledge, and I guess this is... Um, to the best of your knowledge, what what sort of radius this is impacting? Like you know, I, you know, Aberdeen Center and you know some of the things close by. But how how far I guess are you are you seeing this impacting um, lease rates and property values? Well, I would say closer. So within probably the first block to two blocks around the site. However, the impact um, is. Also, like I talk about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law um, is an impact on the entire core, right? Because when somebody speaks of downtown or city center, they don't just speak of Aberdeen Center. They speak it as a whole. And here we're trying to build this community back to something that's rich and um, shows extreme value for our city. This uh, city core is your litmus test for a healthy city. And so our core needs to be healthy in order for the rest of the city to have that healthy structure. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Minhaus. Thank you, Chair Wade Plot. Uh, Wendy, it's already Rotary House is there and they built the new building. You think it'll make more effect on the vacancy on that area with that? thing and as a permanent, permanent structure yes yes and and as with this structure that they're bringing in it does not fit in any capacity the vision of revitalization you can't put in a oil field trailer and expect that to um, showcase what we're trying to showcase after spending millions of dollars in the core to revitalize it, it, it's polar opposite it doesn't look like a trailer, it's kind of building, not um, high class, but it is. To me, it still does. Okay. 
And, the... and, and it is going to be used as a permanent site, you know, be it that it could be on skids and not have a foundation. Uh, nonetheless, it, it is, is it something that you would put up um, in, a, in a new build area? Because essentially that's what we're doing. This is a new build area for our core community. So when you said it's mobile, it should be on the beals. That means that that beal uh, mobile thing is getting moved here and there, or even parked there. That's I think that, that is no good either, you know. I think having the truck um, there um, doesn't impact the assessment rates in regards to a building, right? Because it's obvious it's mobile. And then I think it also works hand in hand for Northreach in the city and our community that if the need is needed somewhere else, um, it can be moved. I don't know if it's always gonna need to be behind Wapiti House. Um, maybe there is better locations and studies will, will show that. But the ability to have it and move it, this is the smallest consumption site that the Alberta government has. I think we just need to leave it alone. It has been working for three years. We have been serving uh, a, popula a population base that needs it, and we have a so social obligation to assist that. Um, but there, there is limits, right, in regards to um, putting putting a structure there that doesn't comply with anything in regards to aesthetics, um, the future vision of the core. Councillor Minhas, Mayor Clayton, please. Thanks, Chair Plot. Uh, echoing some of uh, Councillor Minhas's comments, so your membership is not uh, advocating for the actual mobility of the unit in its intent to be moving around the downtown core. Uh, it's just that you don't want to see the structure as uh, the development permit uh, listed as permanent. That's right. Uh, we don't want to see an um, oil field trailer set up in the core as a permanent structure. The mobile part of it, um, whether it's moved in the core or whether it's moved in other aspects of the city, we can't see in the future if that's a need, but the fact that it was built for that gives us some um, tangible options if we ever need it in the future. And I think that that's a, a strong um, piece that we have here that maybe other cities don't have, and I don't think we wanna lose that. Uh, Councillor O'Toole. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for being here today. <laughs> um, concern I have is the government is basically stopping the use of mobile units, correct? Well, the, there, most are buildings in other cities. We have the only RV truck. Right. And we're happy with it. So with that, they're requesting that the truck go back to them to be used in another location in the province. Yes, to my understanding, they want it in a different location. Um, and I think that's the stand we need to take is either build another truck, find some oil field pods that of your own and set them up in the location that is of concern. Now they did say in the gentleman from Northreach said that uh, the building has to be built before this vehicle is taken away. That's right. Uh, have you sent a letter to the province regarding that you don't want this? Have you done any communication with the province? No, um, to be honest with you, this was thrown on our lap um, with about uh, maybe, well, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Thursday and I had to respond by Friday morning. So there hasn't been enough time to um, move further with this, right? First, what we did is immediately write a letter to ask for an extension, which was granted and appreciated. But this is something that uh, affects a lot of people and not just who is localized around the site. As I said before, it affects the entirety of the core because we are, you know, noted as an in, as an entirety in a community. Absolutely, I'm not disagreeing with anything that you said here so far. It's just that uh, 
yeah, we need to maybe more communicate to the province, I guess. We will have no trouble doing that if, if that is the next step, for sure. I can't vote on this today. It's not my forte for the committee, but uh, uh, it, it is a controversial subject, and uh, I'm looking forward to what uh, they have to offer. So thank you. Okay, I think I uh, see no other hands up. I think I uh, appreciate you coming in and, and uh, working with your downtown association membership to, to come forward with your concerns today. So thanks for coming in, Ms. Bosch. Um, just because we have to clean, uh, do a quick COVID wipe down on the table, I would just look if anybody online would like to uh, turn their camera on or their mic on and uh, speak in opposition to this. Is there anybody online that would like to speak to opposition to this? Okay. Seeing none, I wait. Just, oh, sorry. Wait, I would. Okay. I'm Kevin. Yes, I would. Okay, Kevin. If you don't, if you could, uh, if you could just turn your camera on, um, if you if you're zoomed in, so we can see your face, that would be great. And uh, sure. the floor is yours. Okay. I, you know, I'm probably echoing on many things that have been already talked about at the meeting this morning, but you know, I I do have a concern about the way this whole thing was, was handled. Um, I don't believe sending out a notice to three, three, three uh, properties within 150 feet of, a, of this location is proper for whatever that stands for. But, um, you know, when we talk about um, having to deal with downtown and, you know, I've been, a, I've been a owner of a business downtown for as many years as I can remember. I represent over 70 people that work with us downtown. And I'm struggling to understand the message that the city administration department and our elected officials are standing regarding the city of downtown Grand Prairie. I mean, we've struggled for years with the aftermath of drug violence, criminal activity for as many years as I can remember. There, there was a time when we finally successfully removed sites like Jermaine Park, the Park Hotel, and the York Hotel. Um, and it was awesome. The crime and vagrancy and drug activity declined for a number of years. You know, a time after that, the city then chose to spend mil you know, tens of millions of dollars to create a pedestrian and business-friendly environment downtown. And the goal, from what I understand, is to create a safe, desirable place to work, live, play, and shop, a place where you, you might want to bring your family on evening. Now, at the same time, you're planning to locate a safe injection site in the same area. I just don't understand what message you're trying to send here. Uh, I've been told, um, you know, over the years, that many people within our community will not even shop downtown because they feel it's unsafe. Um, you know, if we've talked about the resale value of buildings downtown and rental costs, I mean, as a, as a building owner in Brantford, we've seen our uh, rental rates drop almost 50% in the last seven, eight years. And why? It's because people are interested, are not interested in, in in, in building their, their businesses downtown, they, they, just, they just assume move somewhere else and pay three times the price. And, and uh, I mean, that should be sending a message to, so I should send a message to downtown people, that's for sure. And I would hope they would send a message to administration. And, you know, I guess my question would be is how many people within uh, the city and the people we're speaking to today would feel safe to bring your family down here after work? I know I wouldn't. Um, you know, are, are we expected now? And, you know, with this mobile site that we had for the last three years, I thought it was, you know, mobility would be key, and yet it sat in one place. And, you know, as Wendy Bosch mentioned, how does it make sense to provide, you know, injections to people that aren't even allowed to go back into the same place that they came out of in the morning? And uh, I just, it's just, it's confusing to me. So where do they where do they go for the rest of the day? They come downtown, and unfortunately, we get to deal with them. And and I'm not suggesting that you know these people don't need help. I just don't believe that a safe injection site located in downtown Grand Prairie is a good choice. It's just not. Um, I mean, it's it's impacting so many people's lives. You know, you have uh, you know a developer attempting to build a 25 million dollar property downtown, which would be the majority residential, I would be worried for them. And I worry about who would want to live down here if this continues. And you'd be worried about parking the vehicles, which we all are here, um, about walking, going for a walk in the evening. 
And again, I don't have any issues with understanding that we do have a social uh, responsibility with people in need. But what about the people that are just trying to make a living here? What about the people that pay taxes? What about rebuilding downtown? And, you know, I believe that the city of Grand Prairie has gone, you know, they've really spent so much money trying to improve um, downtown Grand Prairie, and yet at the same time, we're undermining it. It's confusing to me. You know, and, uh, just, you know, I'll leave it at that. But my last comment is I just really have to disagree with the way this, this last notice was sent out. Um, I, I just think it was improper, and I think it was wrong. So, um, from myself and from 70 plus people that I represent in downtown, I completely disagree with the location of this place. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Cash. Uh, any questions, uh, Mayor Clayton? Thanks, Chair Plot. Thanks for coming today, Mr. Cash. Question: um, You know, as as uh, as you mentioned, a person who has put substantial investment into the downtown, I'm curious in your thoughts of um, you know knowing that the Salvation Army is already downtown and that there's a a, a route and a transition path that. Um, People seem to uh, go from the Salvation Army uh, potentially over to the Friendship Center. Um, the activity that has taken place downtown in the past. Tell me your thoughts on on where you see um, a site, a mobile site such as this. Is it, in your opinion, in proximity to our community care facility? Um, where exactly do you see a potential for a mobile site as such? Well. Being, we're actually right in the traffic zone, right between Rotary House and Salvation Army to come to our parking lot. Um, every few minutes, you'll see someone come to you in the check and doors as they walk to our parking lot. So, you know, that, that hits me pretty hard. It, it, it hits our staff uh, in a very negative uh, way. However, um, I, I guess I'm just complaining about it. At the same time, I believe that if you actually want to get to someone, I think the location should be in a safe environment that isn't affecting others. So, you know, if we were to look at sending someone out to a rehab center or, um, you know, when people are reaching out for help, I really believe that it needs to be in a location where they can't harm others and they cannot be harmed. And, and again, locating these things in the center of the city, to me, it's, it's just it makes no sense whatsoever. And it, it is unfortunate that some of these locations, some of these uh, social um, buildings like Salvation Army and the other guys are located in this area. Um, putting adding more to it makes no sense to me. Thanks for that. Uh, just, just a question uh, for me, Kevin. You mentioned, um, you know, I, I spoke with you lots that you have quite a few properties. Can you just give me an idea of how? What's the impact on your staff? Have you lost any staff, or is your staff um, concerned about coming into downtown? Is that has that been an impact yet, or is it more about lease rates and property values at this point? We we haven't lost any lease rate. We haven't lost any staff over, but it's a, it is a major concern. We've had to ramp up video cameras, lighting. Um, you know, we own a little bookkeeping company as well, where people work late at night, which they do here as well, and they're always concerned when they leave that night. And someone might be behind the corner and does that mean they're going to get accosted? Possibly not. But they're laying there um, doing what they do. And it is unnerving. It really is. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, I guess it is part of society, but having it in your backyard is very difficult to deal with on a daily basis. And, you know, as we're moving into evenings and, and, and winter now, where it's getting dark quite early. Um, it's a concern for any of my people that have to It just is because someone could get hurt. Um, our vehicles are vandalized um, regularly, and um, you know our people are walking to this garden. So it's a concern. Okay. And just one other one. Um, has there been any, I, I know I asked Ms. Bosch this as well, but have you had any correspondence or information relayed to you that would, would show to you that property values haven't diminished downtown or... No, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, we're all aware that you can buy a building downtown for $100 a square foot. You can't build one for 200 So, I mean, it's, uh, and even if you're asking $100 a square foot, they won't get it. 
So no, it, it, it's very common knowledge um, for any any uh, property owner downtown. And I guess that's you know, the choice we made when we bought our properties, that you know, we spent a lot of money buying them, enhancing them, trying to get the clients as the tenants into them, and to have rent values drop, you know, from say eighteen dollars for fifty cents. And it's um, you know, it is unfortunately a product of our environment where people don't feel comfortable being down there. Thanks for that. Um, seeing no other questions in chambers, appreciate you uh, having a, taking the opportunity to talk to council today, and uh, you're welcome to stay on the call. I just ask that you maybe just turn your camera and your mic off, but you're welcome to stay on the call. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to speak to this matter too. Pardon me, if, if you're okay, um, Amy, if I would like to just go back to council chambers because we have quite a few here and I can come back to you if that's okay. So sure. just look to anybody in council chambers that would like to come up and speak in uh, opposition to this. Chair Pilot. City Council and Administration. My name is Dan Wong. I work with Beverstow and Associates Engineering. I'm joined today by Lauren Swanberg, and in the gallery is Janet Gibbs. Uh, they represent Landsman Properties. So we'd like to add our voice in opposition to this development permit. Um, Landsman is directly, or sorry, Aberdeen Centre is the property that they own and um, they are directly west of Wapiti House where, where this development permit application is proposed. Um, they've been suffering from negative impacts by Wapiti House and their clientele for many years and they've worked extensively with the city to try to mitigate some of the impacts by their neighbour. So they've spent a lot of money and time to survive in what used to be a really thriving area of Grand Prairie. I've lived here my entire life. I've never seen it as bad as it has been in the past few years. Um, we have many concerns with the development permit application. Um, so I'll just go through the list. First, um, the mobile consumption unit. It was bound by a, a different set of rules when it was a vehicle, but now that it's a building, we feel that it needs to conform to the land use bylaw, just like every other property needs to. Um, <clears throat> this begins with the definition of the structure itself. It's being called an accessory building. And by definition, an accessory building in the land use bylaw is a building or structure that is subordinate to and exclusively devoted to and located on the same site as the principal building. The supervised consumption site cannot in all honesty be considered an accessory building to the primary building because it's in contradiction to the primary building's use. Um, Rotary House, or sorry, Wapiti House has a rule that no one will be admitted who appears to be drinking or using drugs. And the primary purpose of this mobile or this supervised consumption site is to help people administer their uh, narcotics safely. So now you're asking people who, um, the demographic of people around Wapiti House can go into this unit. Um, use their drugs, and now they don't have access to Wapiti House anymore, which is why there's encampments outside of the, the facility. So you're talking about negative impacts. That is one direct byproduct of allowing this site to coexist. Wapiti House even has another rule which says that drugs and drug paraphernalia in or around the surrounding premises, including vehicles, are strictly prohibited. Again, in direct contradiction to their rules. This building's being called a temporary structure because it doesn't have a permanent foundation, but no one has ever indicated how long this temporary structure is going to be on site. For all intents and purposes, this is a permanent structure. Um, the landsman does not want a long-term neighbor with self-contained fuel tanks, sewage, and water on their site because it adds risk to their property. There is potential for a negative impact. At the very least, we're asking that the city impose conditions on this development permit to address issues of non-conformity to the land use bylaw. So these types of, of conditions are typically triggered for a landowner to bring their property up to current standards by a development permit. That is the only legal 
course of action that that uh, triggers this uh, that that triggers um, the landowner to mitigate any concerns from their neighbors. So, unfortunately, the city is the landowner in this case. So we are asking the city to get to put a condition on to fix some of these problems. Now, to be fair, the landsman has been working with the city and the city has already committed to a number of things just nothing has been done yet so putting these conditions in the development permit don't hurt it at all because it, we're giving you an easy win on this uh, the first is the stormwater runoff from Wapiti House onto the Aberdeen Center lands um, this is in contradiction to um, Alberta environment regulations and city design standards city design standards tell you that you must manage your own stormwater on your property. Well, the stormwater flows from Wapiti House land onto uh, Aberdeen Center lands. Um, at one point, even the, uh, the property to the north th that used to be the Fletcher building, there was snow removal being done. Water drains off of that through the city's lane and it flooded out Aberdeen Center and, w and one of their tenants. So the city should be responsible for fixing those problems. It actually shouldn't take a development permit to trigger that uh, repair because the city should be um, trying to exceed its minimum standards. And the minimum standard is again, that the development permit triggers um, any kind of fixes that are needed for these properties. The second item of concern um, has to do with just the number of homeless people that pass through and loiter on the property and cause negative impacts. So the city has, in conversation with them, committed to changing the location of the access from the west side of Wapiti House to the southeast corner. And in doing that, it would drive a lot of that traffic down with the addition of a fence that closes off that west access. Um, now that, that was a great solution offered by the city, but again, nothing has been done yet. So we'd like to see that uh, condition put onto the development permit as well. So in closing, we just like to reiterate what uh, Wendy from the Downtown Association has said, that property owners are responsible for activity that happens as a direct result of the services they offer. Wapi House provides a great service for, for vulnerable people in the community, but there are also negative effects on adjacent landowners. The city of Calgary recently moved their most successful supervised consumption site at the Sheldon Schumer Center due to activity, which I quote, has been highly disruptive to the neighborhood. And that was from a global news um, newspaper article. If the city wants to have these services at a specific location, they and the agencies that deliver the service must also take responsibility for the ripple effects. That's one of the reasons why the land use bylaw exists. Um, it must allow landowners to legally do whatever is allowed on their property but they must also reduce the negative impacts on everyone else. Um, developments that have such a large potential for uh, negative impact on their neighborhoods, they need more time for these consultations and conversations to, be hap to happen between the impacted parties. Um, this application looks really rushed and it's caused a lot of frustration because of it. We also feel that this location was chosen simply because it has the fewest number of neighbors and it would likely have the least amount of people opposed to it. Now you see that there's 13 letters of opposition plus ourselves. This, I wouldn't say that this has the least amount of opposition and it had the, the lowest number of circulations in, out of many development permits. Uh, the, de the demographic for drug addiction, we know it's quite broad and limited and not limited only to the homeless. So you need to ask yourself, would the average person drive to this facility into a dark corner um, where it, in an area where it feels really unsafe and utilize these services? Or would these services be better served if you chose the proper facility and the proper location? The other thing that we'd like to finally close with is that you need to consider that dispersing these activities might be a better approach than concentrating them. Um, Aberdeen Centre has already suffered from a lot of concentration of this proper problem. Uh, there was a street outreach building that was um, opened up earlier this year. 
they've, they continue to deal with these issues. And to add another building that could potentially, could potentially add more negative impact to them is just unfair. They just happen to be the only neighbor that is directly adjacent to this development. And they've been taking the brunt of all the negative activity. Thank you, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks for coming in today, guys, with that. Um, any questions from the delegates here? Um, I, I just have one, I'll stick to my theme on it. I'm just curious if you can kind of let me know, uh, since uh, I guess a safe consumption van was put in, what it's done to impact the, the property value and potentially the, the leasing of the Aberdeen Center. Sure. So, do you, Lauren, do you want to? Okay. So, what my clients have told me is, you know, they've they're at the highest vacancy rate they have ever been at, um, and as you know, not only do lease rates drop because of your vacancy, but your valuation of your building is based on your vacancy. So, their val the value of their property now is at the lowest it's ever been because of these effects. Now, we can't say that it's directly as a result of supervised consumption site, but that was one of the latest additions to that site. Um, they've been dealing with so many issues. They've added security, they've added fencing, they've, you know, th they've done so much at their own expense. I think it's now time for the city to step up, maybe help them with some of the problems, regardless of whether or not this development permit gets approved, and to try to mitigate future impact to them by not, not increasing what's already been a really bad problem. Okay. And so, uh, Dan, you'd mentioned uh, water issues and, and, and a potential access change. So that's been in conversations with administration, with, with landsmen. There's th those conversations have been ongoing over those issues, or? They have been ongoing, but uh, yeah. We, again, we haven't seen any action. And then just listening to the director's update today, we noticed that there were no construction projects discussing that. Um, those two property um, adjustments that um, were discussed earlier this year. They said that, you know, construction was going to start in July and then it was going to be September. And, you know, we don't know that it's even on the radar this year. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Blatt. Thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. Um, you brought up a good point that has always been a concern to me that people may actually drive to a consumption site and therefore we assume they drive away. So that is ultimately putting our community at significant risk and has always been a concern um, if this consumption site, um, the people that the attendants that are working in it, they're not there to say, hey, how'd you get here? Should you drive home? You know, unlike a, a liquor establishment that if you're over serving somebody, you tell them, you know, you're not to drive home. I don't know if that communication is happening in this facility and it's a big concern. Um, you mentioned that it's that potentially the concentration of it is a concern and that d the disbursement might be a better approach. Um, in your opinion, um, Mr. Wong, as somebody who works with, in a lot of commercial areas across the city, do you see this as multiple mobile units? Um, do you see a permanent site in a different location, a better approach? I'm curious on your personal thoughts. So from my personal thoughts, it, it's actually not for someone who works in the development world to choose this location. It's for the people that work in the agencies to get together and talk about where is the best location, not the easiest approved location. And um, if you do bring in organizations like the Downtown Association to talk about um, what their vision is for the city, I would probably not locate it right near vacant, infill, developable land where um, it's going to directly steer what types of development can, can grow around it. If you're looking at um, developing your tax base and getting something really nice built, I wouldn't concentrate a problem. Thank you for that. Okay, seeing no other questions, guys, thanks for coming in and letting us know your concerns. And again, you're welcome to stick around and watch the rest of the, uh, the community meeting. Um, so we're going to jump back on to Zoom here, and I will go to you, uh, Amy Liebers. Hopefully I said that properly. If you want to just unmute yourself, um, introduce yourself, and then you got about five minutes to speak here, please. You did. Thank you. My name is Amy Liebers. Um, I'm a business owner, um, a tenant of Windsor Court, which is located about a block and a half from Bobbity House. Uh, we are a main floor tenant, and um, we've seen quite a bit of 
action from Wobbly House residents and just local residents um, through our parking lot, through our alleyway, in our vestibules, um, in our washrooms. We had to remove the um, hand sanitizer station. Unfortunately, people were drinking that. Um, so we're, we're quite familiar with the community that, that is in this area. Um, and to speak to that, the mobile um, outreach the, the, the number you can call on the van that comes to address residents who are you know, bothering businesses and tenants has actually been quite good. That's a great program. I just want to say that. Um, we did write a letter. Um, I read a report issued by the government of Alberta. It was issued in March 2020. And some of the findings in that report, and the report was titled, Impact, a Socioeconomic Review of Supervised Consumption Sites in Alberta. So they did a review of consumption sites throughout the province. And some of the main findings were the aggressive and erratic behavior of substance abusers leaving the sites, crime increasing in the immediate vicinity, needle debris was a substantial issue, and in general, supervised consumption sites have had a negative social and economic impact on the community. So I think regardless of where this site ends up going, as it appears to be a need for the community, these issues need to be addressed by the city of Grand Prairie, and there needs to be um, plans in place to address these issues. So I think even if I do agree with Dan Wong and his comments that concentrating a problem is not a great idea, um, wherever the site does go, these will still be result of a supervised consumption site, as has been found by the government of Alberta as recently as last year. So um, as a business owner, as a tenant, I am concerned for the safety of my staff coming and going to their workplace safely from the parking lot at any time of day or night. Someone noted about, you know, the safety of the area at night. This is absolutely a daytime problem. We get people at 8 a.m. drunk at our front door. They're very friendly sometimes. Sometimes they're yelling. Sometimes they're um, passed out. We get, we've get we seen all sorts of things in our location. Um, we've been at this location for many, many years. And I think um, as with the Aberdeen Center, the local businesses around Wapiti House do need more support, and I would like to see a response with an actual action plan for results that we know are going to be from a, a supervised consumption site in, in our city, regardless of the location. So thank you for your time today. Okay, thanks for that, Amy. I'll just look to my colleagues to see if there's any questions for you. Um, seeing none, um, thanks for, for coming in and let us know your concerns and where your location's at. And uh, again, if you want to continue to watch the meeting, you're welcome to do that. Okay. Um, next, I'm actually going to go uh, back to Jonathan. We had a, maybe a miscommunication uh, to speak in support of the, the application. Um, if you don't mind, just turn your camera back on, Jonathan, and, and uh, mm -hmm. the proponent speaks in support of it. Thanks, Kim, for the Yeah, I just want to speak on some some positive aspects of STS and maybe address some things that I've heard so far along the way. Um, many issues that have been talked about so far are focused on social issues that are happening within Grand Prairie. And in my opinion, these cannot be blamed on supervised consumption services. Um, this is some, these are social issues that, that have been around for quite some time. And there's a lot of positive aspects so far, and even uh, some cost savings that SES have have uh, have given the community so far. Like for example, we've only called um, EMS five times in the last three years, and compared to before, that's a lot of EMS calls um, that we've saved so far. And we talk about uh, revitaliz revitalization of downtown, um, increasing positive quality of life. And I think there should be a focus on our community members that do reside in the downtown and the positive aspects SES has, have, has had on saving their lives. Um, we talk about sharing the scene of the city center and I think this directly shares the same vision of our city center because there's a lot of our residents that need to be cared for. Um, 
I know, uh, Amy, you addressed the Government of Alberta report um, against supervised consumption sites. And I'd like to point everyone um, to one of many uh, evidence-based reports um, that is in opposition of the Government of Alberta report. Um, there's a report done um, by a criminologist by the name of James Livingston. And for all people that are in Zoom, I can link that to the chat. And another report that you outlined, Amy, um, outlined a lot of negative aspects to this report. But if you take a look at this report titled Supervised Consumption Sites and Crime, Scrutinizing the Metho Methodological Weaknesses and Apparent Results of a Government Report in Alberta, Canada, um, I think reading this report will give everyone a new insight, a new lens on uh, the results of the report that was done. And I can link that in the chat now for people that are in there. Um, and in closing, I just want to ensure that when we're having conversations around this, that we're not basing it solely on the social issues that we're having within the city of Grand Prairie, but we're basing it solely on the fact that we're taking a mobile unit and we're providing the exact same service and increasing people's quality of life within our city. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, any questions? Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Pilat. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Power. Uh, I got a few questions here. So, I'm actually on that uh, that uh, report that you that you mentioned right now, um, and it says major aims of supervised consumption sites include providing an environment for safer drug use, improving the health status of people who use drugs, and mitigating public disorder, which is straight in line with, uh, I guess, everything you said and perhaps some of our results. My question for you is, though, uh, when people access a supervised consumption site, uh, what what uh, what steps are taken to encourage people to engage in counseling or rehabilitation for for their their drug use? Um, obviously, this is safer, and we're trying to mitigate public disorder and improve the health status status of people using drugs. But how are we encouraging them, or is Northreach, I guess, specifically encouraging people to seek out the help and uh, maybe refer them to places where they can get the appropriate rehab and resources to do so. Yeah, thank you for that question, Councillor. Uh, so just to put into um, some perspective, um, we facilitated um, 151 addictions treatment referrals last year. Um, and 73 individuals went through detox. So it's one of the main highlights that I'd like to point out as well is that people aren't just coming into our facility to use substances. They're accessing social services and we're connecting them with whatever social services they need, whether that's financial support, um, whether it's detox, whether it's treatment, that sort of thing. Um, and one other thing along that detox and treatment line um, in the overview, when Eugene went over the floor plan, there's a, there's a room in there which we're entitled treatment, which is allowing us to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with individuals in order to do addictions counseling and to allow them to better leave um, their life of drug use and allow for people to move along um, the spectrum of drug use, which is something that we're not currently able to do and not currently have the confidential space to allow for. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I see uh, Mayor Clayton, sorry, Chair Platt. I do have other questions though, Jonathan, so uh, you on your toes. Go ahead, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Platt and uh, Assistant Chair Thiessen. Um, uh, question for um, the gentleman on the line. I'm wondering in regards to um, you mentioned um, the priorities based on this facility. Tell me um, what advocacy work you've done in regards to mobile consumption sites as a whole. Um, if this 
as you mentioned it earlier, uh, if this facility, the development permit were not to be approved, um, there's a risk that um, there would not be a site at all in our city. And, and I think council has recognized that, um, you know, there, there's a need for this site. We know our numbers show that. Um, but I'm curious, in conversations with the government or any advocacy work that you've done, is there a true and honest threat that if, if this development permit isn't approved, that the mobile site actually goes away and then the consumption just goes back to the street? Um, I act, I don't think there is a threat just because as Wendy said, when she spoke, um, there is, um, there is such high overdose rates in our community that I, I believe the province would not allow us to continue as a community without supervised consumption services. Um, what would happen was that would be that we are now unable um, to provide extra services for individuals and allow them to perhaps move on and move out of the move out of the culture that they're currently in. Yeah, thank you for that, and I can appreciate those comments. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Uh, we're just going to go back to Councillor Thiessen for a couple questions, and Councillor Friesen, please. Well, I, I do have a couple questions. I'll only ask one for now and then I'll trade off to Councillor Friesen and she might ask one of my questions here as well. Um, so I guess, Jonathan, uh, kind of in relation to the mayor's question, um, in regards to, uh, depending on what uh, committee does here today and or council, um, if there was, uh, if we chose one of the alternatives as far as uh, what uh, Mr. Wong was, was talking about in fixing our stormwater runoff, um, and uh, changing different uh, pedestrian access routes, uh, as well as perhaps like spruce up the outside of the echo trailer and connect to city services. Who bears that cost? Is that the province or is that Northreach? Uh, everything that is concerned with the SCS would be the province. Um, yeah, that would be the province of Alberta. Okay. No, thank you. That's uh, my question for now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Friesen. Thank you, Chair Palat. Thank you, Mr. Fortune. Um, <clears throat> as the operator, is your preference a mobile unit or would you prefer a permanent structure? Uh, well, this, this change came as a surprise to us as it did everyone else. Um, but now that we have... Um, a newer plan in place. Um, this is our new preference because we're able to offer better services for individuals and uh, provide a better service to our downtown. Thank you. And did you have input on the site when the mobile unit first uh, was approved or first was uh, available in Grand Prairie? Uh, Sorry, did I have input on that? On the site. Yeah, so uh, originally community consultations were done and it was determined that a mobile unit uh, was appropriate for, for this location. Um, and then things evolved and here we are. And if you had your pick of site or location, would this continue to be it? Or do you think as we've heard from um, some speakers today, do you think there may be a better site potentially? Um, for the purposes of site usage and, the, and wanting individuals to use this service, it makes the most sense that is located on Wapiti House or near Wapiti House. Thank you. Just gonna pull my own number here before I go back to Councillor Thiessen. Just, um, can you give me an, uh, your thoughts, I guess, um, you know, one of the speakers today that come in was speaking about, seems like a contradictory use to have a facility like this that's 
uh, administering drugs when you have a, a building that they can't use those in. Can you just explain that combination and, and um, the concerns about that, please, from, from Northreach's perspective? Sure. Um, almost every individual who is experiencing homelessness in our community, or a very high percentage of that, are individuals who use drugs and they use drugs every single day. And because of how dangerous the tainted drug supply is now, um, that's why we need this service. And although Wapiti House doesn't formally allow drug use within their building, um, that's why this service is so essential because people are using drugs and we need a place to keep them safe. Um, because our rates are so very high for overdoses in Grand Prairie. Okay, and I guess just when I hear that, I guess the concern for me is if we're having folks that are coming with issues like that, it just seems weird to put such an easy source right beside the building if we truly are concerned with, with that. Um, just my comment on that. Uh, another question I have, I guess, is, is just regarding um, the ability for them, uh, if with a newer proper structure, would have more space to do counseling services. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard through lots of social agencies is trying to let everybody stay in their own lane and not everybody overlap. So are we missing something currently that I'm maybe not aware of that we don't have a lot of opportunities for uh, conversations for people that have addictions issues that are already agencies that exist to do that? Yeah, currently with the population that's accessing services at Wapiti House, um, the current addiction services that we have in Grand Prairie um, isn't always catered to this population because it's very much a, a service where individuals have to come to them. Um, but this would be a scenario where we're bringing services directly to them. Um, so they're able to access services um, directly on site as they're coming in to access supervised consumption services. So it's immediate access to facilitating detox and treatment if need be, which is different than um, them having to go off site to NAC or Aberdeen, for example. Okay, so if you, if you can just walk, so walk me through that process, I guess. So uh, an individual comes in and you, and you just, and they say they would like counseling services. Or is that in a call to an external agency that does that? Or is this another function of what's gonna happen at their outside of the agencies that currently do that? Yeah, so we wouldn't be doing formal um, addictions counseling on site. We would be facilitating the access to outside resources but without that bridge there and without that one-on-one -on -one confidential space to make that happen, um, individuals will not access services at NAC or Aberdeen or anywhere else. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'll go back to Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, uh, Chair Pilat. Thank you, Mr. Fortune. I know I've been calling you Mr. Power all day. I don't know why I had uh, your last name as Power in my head, but uh, like thank you. Names. Thank you, I think they're both great last names, but uh, let's stick with Fortune because it is yours. Um, I guess uh, my question is for you, uh, uh, so the hours of operation of the supervised consumption site, um, obviously there are certain times that people have to be inside Rotary House and there are certain times that people have to be outside Rotary House. Uh, what are the hours of operation of the supervised consumption site sir, currently? The hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, so if anyone were to require those services before or after, they're sort of left uh, to, to their own means? That's correct. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, now, I guess um, um, I, I understand the space increase and I, and I applaud the uh, I applaud the, uh, the the making sort of space for counseling and uh, addiction uh, referrals and stuff like that for people who would be using that. Um, but currently, like we know that the site has been, or the mobile site has been pretty stationary for the past couple of years at least. Um, does the site ever move? Like, or has it just been parked uh, and sitting there? No. Yeah, no, that, that site has never moved locations in the, uh, since we've opened it. Um, so it would be pretty much the exact same service that we've been operating um, since we opened the mobile unit. Um, even though it's considered mobile, we've never opened operations other than in that exact same spot where we sat. 
Okay, and uh, just uh, in, in regards to the use of the site, so you said uh, earlier uh, 30 to 40 people per day and 203 unique individuals throughout the year. Um, what's, what's the busiest? Have you guys ever been over capacity where you've had to have people line up outside the, the site, outside the truck in order to um, use consumption services? Uh, yes, it's happened a few times, um, especially uh, recently. Um, we've been over capacity, especially within the last three weeks. Um, there's been more people needing access to service. Okay, and then um, I guess um, I have two two more questions. One you one you may not be able to answer. Maybe I'll ask that one first. Um, a lot of our homeless people, and you and I have had this conversation in the past, uh, a lot of our, our homeless people or people on ACE or, or Alberta Works or, or whatnot, they've um, all cashed in their CERB checks um, has a, a different point. They signed up for the program. They've been getting a little bit extra money in their pocket. Um, over the time of COVID, have we seen an increase in the use of those services? Your services, I guess, uh, at the supervised consumption site? We've seen an increase in services, but there's no way in telling if it was access to CERB or decrease in mental health because of the pandemic uh, with four more restrictions in place. Um, but we have definitely seen an increase in service, and that's like every other social service agency in, in Grand Prairie. Okay, thanks for that, Mr. Fortune. I guess my last question here for you uh, would be, um, so the province has said that they want to move uh, the site to somewhere else, uh, and so they're going to discontinue this service here in Grand Prairie. And essentially, I guess the proposal is to put in uh, a more stationary but still mobile uh, trailer site. Uh, it just doesn't have sort of the wheels on it. Um, has, has the province intimated um, uh, that they would take that even if you couldn't find an accessory building uh, to house these services in? And have they intimated where they might be moving uh, this this supervised consumption site on wheels? They haven't confirmed where they're moving the SCS to. Um, however, they are open to different options, um, but upon discussions with Rotary House and them initially wanting um, us to go inside Rotary House, but then there was no room for that. Um, it made sense to just um, put forward and propose this model um, based on the needs. And the intention was to keep it almost the, uh, the exact same as the mobile unit we have now. Um, but you're right, it's just uh, a building sitting on blocks uh, without wheels. And it was our intention to keep it as mobile as possible in case it needed to be moved. Okay, thank you very much for, for all your answers, Mr. Fortune. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to circle back. I just have uh, a couple more questions for you as well. Um, you're, you're getting the bulk of them because you're the, the only one here, I guess, today and speaking in favor of it. But uh, just in our packages, council packages on page 19 of this report, it's got some costs of what it's, what it's costing for Grand Prairie. I'm just wondering if this facility were to go ahead and become more of a permanent structure, would that budget also be changing to operate this facility? Uh, no, the operational budget uh, would stay the same. Um, initially, um, there's more security in place while it gets built. Um, so we have 24 hour security proposed in place um, while it's getting built because there's going to be more. Um, action around there. Well, not, not when it's getting built, but when it's putting in place because it's getting built off site. So while that's happening and while it's getting put in place, there's security in place. But other than that, um, the operational budget is staying the exact same. Okay. And do you have any opinions of why our cost per average uh, visit is substantially high, like up to 10 times higher than other places in the province and then our average cost per unique client? up to 100, 120 times higher than other uh, jurisdictions. Do you have any a sense of scale of why it's such disproportional in Grand Prairie? Mm, 
No, I don't, but I'd like to get back to you and counsel on that question um, and do some more research on that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, seeing no other questions, I think you're off the hook for now, Jonathan, and I appreciate you taking the time to come in and speak on behalf of that. And if you could get that information to council, that would be much appreciated. Thanks. Uh, so thanks for that. And I'll just look, I believe uh, we've got Miss Gustafson has been sitting here patiently. You're, I think, the last one uh, left to go, uh, unless there's some more folks on Zoom that I'm not aware of. But if you want to just introduce yourself and, and take about five minutes, please. Hello, I'm Alison Gustafson. I have a business downtown. Um, and I wanted to reiterate what Kevin Sakash has mentioned, uh, Amy has mentioned, um, Lauren Swanberg and Dan Wong have mentioned. Um, I do believe that the timing and delivery of this proposal was really quick for anyone to actually respond. Um, like Wendy said, like to approach the province. Um, and in the first presentation, I believe the gentleman said that there was no economic impact, but there is a huge e economic impact to us as business owners. Um, we have had people phone us and tell us they want to come, but they don't want to come downtown because of the homeless people. Um, we've had the homeless people in our store uh, scaring our clients and leaving. Um, We've had them approach our staff. Our parking lot in the back has been covered in needles. We have this Saturday, there was a fire in the back alley. Um, my staff were scared to get here. Our vehicles have been, been vandalized. They've been kicked, they've been scratched. They've been keyed. Um, unfortunately, because we're kind of, our back parking lot is indented, we've actually come out and had people um, like trying to get into our cars. So my staff have been scared. Our clients have been scared and they choose not to come downtown anymore. We've heard it from them. Um, we do phone the RCMP and they're really good to come. They're great. Uh, we have them on speed dial, unfortunately. Um, and we call them every time because I I know that if you if we don't call then no one thinks that there's a problem, but there is a really huge problem and it doesn't impact us. Um, it is really hard to navigate this nowadays. And um, yeah, it, I just wanted everyone to hear that the downtown businesses are struggling. And I reiterate, I couldn't have said it better what Kevin said uh, and Amy and um, and Lauren, like I really, feel that I, we are strongly opposed to the site. Okay. Thanks for that, Ms. Gustin. I'll just ask if there's anybody in council chambers for any questions. Nope. Seeing none, I think you're you're uh, near the end of this where you've uh, probably reiterated most, so don't take offense that there was no questions to you specifically, but I do thank you for coming in and, and asking. Uh, thank so, you. Yeah. And I see there is one other, uh, uh, Jenny Gillespie, are you here to speak in opposition to this? Yeah, you bet. Um, I'm basically just reiterating what everybody else said, but um, I have just moved into downtown a year ago, our business, just seeing, I was really impressed with the efforts put into downtown to beautify it and to make it nicer. Um, then when I'm hearing about a safe consumption site, you know, it's the big round eyed emoji. It's like, oh, don't, don't do that. Um, that has been an issue already in the year that I've been there where we've had people come into our store and it is very intimidating and frightening. Although it's nice that to have a number to call, you don't have a chance to call that number. So basically all five feet of me has to go up and ask them to leave, which, um, they have thus far, but it's not my forte for sure. Um, I just feel a safe injection site will increase the negative impact of the homeless and addicted on our business and also that impact on they themselves. It's heartbreaking to see these young people um, addicted and homeless and trapped in this lifestyle. I mean, my dream would be that the downtown core would be a place where they could 
access um, actual help for recovery addiction or sober living or job training. Um, having seen some people go through addiction and detox and, you know, a 21 day program, it's, it's awful. And, you know, for the people to get rehab, like proper 90 day rehabs is $40,000. Like can, can some of this money be spent to actually help them? That would be my thought. So yeah, the impact on our businesses is, and our city is, a negative one. So thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Ms. Glassy, I'll just look around and see if there's any questions for you in Chambers. Um, seeing none, thanks again for coming in for your time and voicing your concerns. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else on Zoom uh, that was here to speak in opposition or uh, support this application? Okay, seeing none on Zoom and none in Chambers, I'm just going to ask if we can take a quick five-minute break for council here, uh, a bio break, and we'll reconvene at uh, 10 after 11, if that works.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're uh, thanks for the little quick break there. Um, I guess we've had all of our delegates, and we've heard from administration. So I'll just open the floor now to committee for direction on this. I'm not seeing a bunch of hands go up here um, for direction. Um, I guess for me, I'll just speak on uh, some concerns I'd have with it. I do think if we're going to look at something like this and this to this scale. We should be treating this the same as any other development permit application that comes in, and, and we should be making sure that, um, you know, to me, we we I would want to see it be a uh, a structure that would have full water sewer. I'd want to see the the landscaping plan done with the storm plan. Um, I'd actually like to see inc increased architectural controls. I'd like to see us have a year term of where this could expire. So I have a lot of loopholes for me to want to support it today. Uh, I guess as one councillor, I'm really struggling to want to support this in its current form. Um, but that's for me, and I'll just open that. We'll hopefully look for the conversation on this. Uh, Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Um, there are a, a lot of problems with how this uh, has come to us. Um, this is a provincial decision that maybe makes sense for the province of Alberta, but does not make sense for the residents of Grand Prairie or the operator of the supervised consumption site um, because of the pushback that it's getting. Um, and it certainly doesn't uh, make sense um, for, for the downtown core. And as much as I support um, Arm reduction, and I've heard from many of those speaking uh, for and and against this development permit. There are those who understand that there is the need for something, but this isn't this isn't it, and this is rife with with concerns. It I I think that uh, this may be an opportunity for us as a council to push back against. Uh, the provincial process in this and the the speed I mean even Mr. Uh, Fortune said that it was a surprise to them when it was uh, um, when they were told that this would be the case and for council to have heard what we heard today and proceed even with the concerns that we have and the frustration with the province I, I think is uh, a mistake today and I'm hopeful even though I can't make a motion I, I I don't think it would be unreasonable if a motion came forward that we uh, deny this development permit today or postpone and uh, use the opportunity to make sure that the province knows what the issues are and uh, how it does impact the experience of our residents in Grand Prairie, our business owners in the downtown core, customers who want to come to the downtown core, and uh, the the overall experience of what we see on our streets as a result of our um, heightened uh, our heightened rate of addiction in Grand Prairie. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Friesen. Uh, Councillor Thiessen, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plott. Um, I'm debating a motion, but I'm, I'll just speak right now uh, as far as uh, kind of my feelings on, on this uh, development uh, permit. Um, I think uh, the, the supervised consumption site has had some benefits to our, our street-engaged population. It's also had some negative uh, impacts on the local and surrounding businesses and our downtown core. Um, speaking as someone from council, uh, you know, uh, I think we experience a lot of the same stuff that some of the businesses experience uh, as sort of the runoff uh, of kind of people um, being mired in their addictions. Um, I know myself personally, like over the last month, I've picked up and syringes, you know, just in the lead up walkway to our council entrance. Um, I've seen feces like right by our council entrance and in different places. And I've also seen people urinating on this property as well. 
Um, so I know that those are, are some of the, the negative, negative impacts of people in addictions with really no place to go. Um, I think we're... I think we're at a saturation point uh, that the province doesn't really understand. I really like the, the supervised consumption site and the mobile nature as it first came to the city of Grand Prairie. It was something that we highlighted and something that we were very proud of, that we could go to people where they're at. Uh, and now we've created a space where people come to us and people can just drop into the Rotary House overnight. And some, some are honest people who are just down on their luck and some people are those types of people that I would consider um, kind of to be, I would say, vultures, scavengers, you know, people who are, are preying off of the vulnerabilities of other people. And they make space at, at Rotary House as they're allowed. Uh, they keep their business quiet, and then they find people who are in, in these bad situations. And then they can just walk around the building and engage into drug use. And I think there might be a better way. Um, we had a presentation from a local delegation who was trying to help steer some of the some of the, these issues away from the downtown core, present to council. Her name was Robbie King. Uh, and one of her solutions was to create ACO trailers, but not in the downtown core. Uh, it was to be to find places that we could maybe get people to, to help them with counseling services, rehab, and even supervised consumption if, if they so choose, but farther away and on the outskirts of town. And this, is, uh, this has been a solution that's proposed by many, and I know it doesn't necessarily meet people where they're at, but if people want help, it's hard to, it's hard to help themselves when they're surrounded by the same influences that impact their everyday life. Um, it has been said by one of my council peers that this appears to be our premier trying to save political lives versus lives in Grand Prairie. Um, I don't know if, you know, taking away our mobile consumption site uh, and putting in what essentially is another mobile consumption site just without the wheels um, is necessarily the solution. I think the space uh, that it would help, uh, as Mr. Fortune said, to give people access to counseling services and other stuff like that could be beneficial to them. But I, I don't know if those negative impacts will, will uh, supersede any of the benefits that they, that they might have. So as somebody who wants to help as many people as possible, uh, I do realize that this is an ongoing issue and it's, it's not actually getting better. Um, I don't know if I want to engage into other discussions about moving it to different sites within the city. Um, and I think that this, as Councillor Friesen mentioned, this might be an, an opportune time for us as a council and a community uh, to step up to the province and you know, ask them for better solutions, better strategies to address this, rather than saying, no, we don't want a physical space building and providing these reports that were included in our package by some people in opposition uh, that a year ago said that these sites are, are bad for the community and the area that they're in. Uh, there are benefits to them, but um, um, sometimes uh, the negative consequences of, of such create a saturation point where it just becomes a problem that is perpetuating itself. Um, so I'm really, I'm really struggling with this uh, because I really believe in rehab, counseling, and treatment, and those are services that we don't have enough of in Grand Prairie and the Peace Region. So I, I think depending on where the conversation goes and uh, after this and where this development permit goes, um, it gives us an opportunity as a community to ask for those services to come to Grand Prairie with the province and to ask them to create a plan and solution and work with communities to actually address the situation and get people the help they so rightfully deserve. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that uh, for now and I'll see what the rest of my council peers have to say. But at this moment, I'm, I'm not leaning in favor of approving this development permit as it stands. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Plott. Uh, I echo the sentiment of Council Friesen as well as Councillor Thiessen. There's big concerns uh, in this application, in my opinion. Right in our advocacy strategy, strategies, we talk about community-based health supports. So in order to have community-based health support, we have to have community input. This uh, seems to be a top-down approach to uh, and 
providing a solution um, for the needs in our community, but it hasn't included the engagement of our community, uh, in my opinion. And I think that um, that administration did what they needed to do in regards to consultation. However, in my opinion, the consultation could have been much broader. That although the residential out uh, the east side of the area didn't need to be uh, consulted. There's absolutely impact uh, residentials that are just east of, of the location. And so to have a community-based solution, as some of the uh, advocates online talked about, um, Mr. Wong identified bringing the social service groups together, finding a location that makes sense. Councillor Thiessen referenced a delegate that we had here a few weeks ago in regards to having an off-site rehabilitation program, um, not just simply a uh, safe consumption site, but what that meant for full uh, rehabilitation and recovery opportunities for those who need our support. Um, this development permit, in my opinion, uh, is not in the best interest of our community. Um, I agree, and I think all of council agrees, that there is a need for safe consumption. As a small business owner downtown, I don't, I want the safety of my staff to be uh, secure. I don't want them to have to walk out the back door and be subjected to somebody potentially with a needle. I don't want them picking up needles in the morning. Uh, so as Councillor Tisa mentioned, these are in our face all the time as people who live in the downtown core, as people who work in the downtown core, and there needs to be a solution for this. And so therefore, I think there is an opportunity for safe consumption. I don't think that a permanent solution, uh, as suggested in this development permit, is the right solution for our community. Uh, so I will not support this development permit. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Clayton. Um, you know, I'm going to echo everything that I'm hearing from my colleagues around here. I also can't support it. I think this leads to a much bigger advocacy piece for the city and for future the next council to work on. Um, we've talked a lot about how we're going to work on this, but specifically on the Rotary, or I guess Wapiti House and the site, um, I hope the next council has a lot more conversations about how to get this area cleaned up in general. Um, we've seen some tent cities go up and down and we've think, seen things go on there, but it, to me, a, a robust plan of how we're gonna rejuvenate this area of our, of our corner of downtown needs to happen. And I think uh, allowing this development permit today actually goes against us having that conversation. And I think just kind of band-aids another problem that we're already seeing downtown. Um, it's 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 very disheartening hearing from all the, the, the folks that have come in today, just hearing how it's impacting our business. I'm curious to know if the city knows how much it's costing us on advocacy thing, what we've lost in tax revenue, potential tax revenue of devaluing of these properties downtown. That's probably a number that would be nice to, to, to start sharing with the province saying, not only is it costing us this much to administer, we've actually lost this much revenue. And so, um, you know, speaking, you know, hearing Ms. Bosch speaking about all the money we put in downtown, um, We've spent an awful lot of money and effort in this council and the previous council to get downtown revitalized. And I think because we haven't addressed some of the big elephants in the room, um, it hasn't changed the overall complexity of downtown enough in my opinion. So um, as much as I'd like to see us work with this proponent, I, I can't support this development permit without a, a whole list of conditions. And at that point, it totally changes the complexity of what they're even applying for. So, so I also couldn't support this development permit in its current context. So having said that, I, I'm not sure if we need a motion for administration to actually not approve the, the permit or what, uh, just look to legislative services, that is the case. So, um, Councillor Thiessen. All right, I would, uh, I would move that. I don't know if to do this in the positive or the negative, but I would move that. Sorry. I'll just move simply that the, the committee uh, deny the development permit application. Okay, I'll just, um, I see before we go to councils, I just see uh, Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Pilot. Um I'll have uh, <clears throat> Eugene correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you, there needs to be at least a reason uh, from the land use bylaw uh, stated for refusal. Okay. So while we're, while we're trying to find that reason, I guess I'll look if anybody on council has any specifics. Um, I, th I think Mr. Wong mentioned a few of them. Like there's, there's uh, it's contradictory to itself, it seems like right now, this application um, for, for potentially, well, I guess for me, it seems odd that we'd allow something that if the proponent, the main building doesn't allow drugs in it. It seems weird to allow accessory building that allows drugs in that. So I'm not sure if that's enough to contravene uh, with our land use planning. 
but I'd look to administration to find us a, a solution on that if that is what's holding us back here. Yeah, the, uh, Mr. Wong mentioned the accessory building. Uh, when we look at the accessory building, we got to look at the use. And the accessory building structure is a permitted use in the CC district. Access, uh, accessory use is permitted use in the CC district. So then we got to look at the use of the principal building. The building, the Wabadi Dorm, was approved in 2009 under a different development permit as an essential public service classification of use. So it's, I can give you the definition of that. It means the development that is necessary for the continued health and safety or welfare of the residents includes fire stations, ambulance services, police stations, and similar facilities. Somehow this homeless got included in that. And the definition of a community outreach, certainly, uh, you know, we're satisfied that accessory building is subordinate to and located on the same site as the principal use and is exclusively devoted to. We don't look at uh, if a business has a model or does not consider drug use. Drug use has been there three years by the size of this building now. Uh, we don't consider that. We consider the use, the use, not the user, not the needles. Okay, uh, I seen Director Glavin with his hand up, but I just want to ask a question. I guess then is one of the alternatives in our report, the very first one, is saying refuse the development permit application. So that was in our report. So I, I guess just to kind of defend Councillor Thiessen's motion, that was one of the options that was in our report. So I'll just go back to Director Glavin for that, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair Plot. Um, yes, certainly was an option. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion that councils had today has been around compatibility. Uh, which would be something you could cite as a reason for refusal. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Director Glavin. So I'll look to Councillor Thiessen if he maybe wants to amend his motion. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I would. Uh, I would. Uh, I will. I'll move, and then uh, we'll see if if where we go with this. Uh, that was sort of my hesitation because I was like, well, if I just say no, or if we just say no, then we can just get. You know, we can have it come back on us and we have to deal with it anyways. So I would move that um, committee refuse the development permit application as the use of the accessory structure is not compatible with the principal building. Thank you for that, Councillor Thiessen. And I just want to double check with administration with that amendment. Does that uh, meet the intent or does that not qualify? Thank you, Chair Plot. Um, just in discussing with Eugene, it sounds like that is uh, sufficient. Um, ultimately, this is always subject to appeal. Um, so at the SDAB, there, um, it could get appealed to the SDAB. Thank you for that. Um, any discussion or debate on the motion? Thiessen? So just speaking to the motion, um, it's not the strongest motion, and I understand that. Um, um, I guess... Uh, the only other way that I might be able to phrase this motion is to set on a number of conditions as as uh, as as I stated earlier and as was brought up by some of our delegations, everything from fixing the stormwater to making it look better. But at the same point, I, I'm not certain that I want a, a permanent structure here for this purpose in the same area. Uh, I understand that we have a lot of people who have been using and and uh, you know that's their little circle to go around in, um, but uh, and so it seems to make sense there. But as as I stated earlier, there's a saturation point, uh, and we'll, and I think we're getting close to crossing that if we haven't already, as far as uh, safety and other risks. Um, so in this one, um, I'm I'm okay with that. I, I have a subsequent motion to go through, um, so hopefully it might uh, mitigate any appeals that would force our hands. Um, and maybe open up the door for discussion with the province. Uh, but for these reasons and the reasons stated above, um, it is a, it is a contra contradictory use, and once we take the wheels off of the mobile site, uh, it's not necessarily going anywhere. So uh, because the rules are as they are uh, in Rotary House, where you're not allowed to be intoxicated in any way, shape, or form, um, I think uh, it would be... I think it would be contradictory for a council to approve the use of a structure that is as close to permanent uh, as it could be um, saddled up right beside and behind uh, the Rotary House when 
you know, it's clearly in contradiction of their rules. So that's that's all I have to say for that. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thiessen. Uh, Councillor Friesen. Thank you. Um, just a point of clarification on that. I think that the, the Rotary House not allowing someone who's intoxicated or uh, on drugs is inside the building. It's not uh, on the prop on the pro they're not kicked off the property. So that's a distinction that I, I think needs to be on the table here. Um, but I think Councillor Thiessen actually may meet what I wanted to say with his next motion, and that has to do with um, making sure that the province is very well aware of the position that this uh, has put our community in. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Mayor Clayton? Oh, sorry, I'm just going to go to our legislative services. Amanda? Thank you, Chair Pallott. I just have a note from administration uh, noting that this is compatible with the principal building um, because it supports it as a subsidiary use, but it's not compatible with the neighborhood. If you want to clarify that in your motion. Okay, I'll just come back to Councillor Thiessen, let him think about that for a minute so he's not swordsmith and on the fly, and I'll go to Mayor Craig, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work with Councillor Thiessen on the motion and in my intent, um, the purpose being that it materially interferes with or affects the use, enjoyment, or value of the neighboring parcels of land. So if, okay, <laughs> thanks. Councillor Thiessen with a thumbs up on that. So. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make a verbal acknowledgement that uh, I appreciate the friendly additions to the motion uh, provided by the mayor. Thanks for that, Councillor Thiessen. Is there any other discussion or debate from Council before we go to motion to, to this vote? Seeing none, I'll just give uh, Legislative Services a minute to get the wording on that, and then we'll hop on to rescribe and make a, make a vote. Let's look to Amanda and see if we're, we're good to go ahead here now. Before we vote on that, can I have a question for administration? Yes, go ahead, Mayor Clayton. Um, just to Mr. Tobin or uh, Director Glavin, is that uh, satisfactory in your intent in regards to a reason? Right, thank you. Okay, so I think we are good. If you can go on to your e-scribe and please vote. Or if you're not set up, if you can, uh, we'll go through it and just let us know by Mike on and telling us how you're voting. Oh, sorry, I voted wrong. Um, and just uh, let it be noted, uh, my e-scribe's not loading, so I vote in favor. I vote in favor as well. Okay, thank you for that. And that carries. Um, so I'll go back to Councillor Thiessen for what he was mentioning a subsequent motion as well. Yeah, so for my, my subsequent motion, I believe it has to go to Council as uh, it would be to instruct the, the Mayor to write a letter. But uh, I would move that uh, Committee uh, direct Council to direct the Mayor to write a letter to the province in regards to supervised consumption services, uh, their proper locations, impacts on our community and alternative um, ways to address this issue going forward. Okay, thanks for that motion. I'm just gonna look at slide services to see if they've got that captured and I'll just ask if there's any questions. Uh, Councillor Friesen. Thank you, if I could make a friendly amendment to that um, the letter also include the necessity of such uh, services in the city of Grand Prairie. Yep, I'm, I'm amenable to that. Okay. Any other questions from council on this? Okay, seeing none, we'll again, we'll hop on to rescribe and if you could please vote. And if you don't have your rescribe up, if you could just verbally... Uh, Air clip. Clayton votes in favor. In favor. 
that carries unanimously as well. Um, I, is there any other motions coming from this? Uh, and I know I'm not a, I'm not somebody that can put a motion forward. I guess for me, I would I would would be able to, would be willing to ask somebody to take the chair or maybe see if one of my colleagues would make a motion. I do think that this is something that uh, I'd, I'd like to see administration bring back a report as one of the, uh, I think it was Mr. Wong mentioned, um, it's a little disheartening to hear that we maybe own a piece of land that isn't following proper land use planning as far as storm management and some of those issues. Um, in order to respect the landsman group in that area, I think the city should be holding ourselves at a higher level on, on all these sort of things. So I would hope that somebody could maybe like a motion that administration would bring back a report about potential fencing, uh, site access, and stormwater management plan for this site. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Chair Pallette. Uh I can make that motion. I was trying to scribble it down, but I also heard uh, our, uh, Ms. Van Beekfeld uh, typing away. So I think she's captured the intent of your motion, and I can make that for you. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Any discussion or debate on Councillor Thiessen's motion? Seeing none, if we can just go under e scribe, I guess I'll go under e scribe, and if you guys can let uh, them know. How you vote? In favor. In favor. And that also passes unanimously. So thanks for that. I, if, oh, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Pilate. I just had a question for administration. I was wondering uh, for Ms. Sutherland. Um, could you tell me if uh, through your social services network, if there's been discussions of alternate options and, and uh, locations for an injection site. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I think at the onset when the SES first came to fruition, there were discussions at that point. Um, I am not aware of any consul consultations at this point around this new um, update that the province had provided to us to do. Okay, I guess my concern is is you know, we can, I'm happy to advocate on behalf of council with the province and and um, based on the intent today, um, if for some reason the province were to be unfortunately negative in that response and um, in turn take away this opportunity, um, I would hate to see the funding lost. So I'm curious, um, in your opinion, if there's an opportunity here for us to get some social services together to talk about various options and locations. So through the chair, yes, definitely. I will connect with um, Mr. Fortune, and we'll have a discussion on next steps for that. Perfect. And do you would you like direction from committee, or are you fine with just taking that as part of your day-to-day -day sort of engagement? I think we could take care of that. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Mayor Clayton. Uh, any other questions or conversations about this matter? Okay, seeing none, I'll, I guess we can ask Councillor Bressy to come back into chambers. There he is, and he can uh, take over chairing the rest of the meeting. Let's give him a minute to get set up here. Great, thank you, Councillor Pallott, for taking the chair. It is very much appreciated by me. And moving on to item 4.1, we have an item of correspondence from the Grand Prairie Downtown Association. I suspect that we likely addressed it earlier. Maybe there are some motions, but I also know that in response to this, the city has sent a letter to the Downtown Association and other interested parties. I wonder if there'd be any issues getting that letter attached to our agenda document so that members of the public could read that response if they wish. I'll look at Director Glavin to ask if that's possible. Thank you, Chair Brassi. I believe that's uh, no issue. Would there be any objections from anybody around the table about that happening? Great. Uh, with that in mind, is there anybody that's got an item of business for this letter? Can we at least get a motion to receive for information? I saw Councillor Thiessen first. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Brassi. I would move that uh, committee uh, receive the Downtown Association's letter for information. Great. Thank you. Is there any discussion or debate? I will call it to question. In favor. In favor. Oh. There we go, and that motion carries, and we have no other business. We have no bylaw and policy review, so that brings us to our outstanding items list, and that is Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Brassi. Uh, no updates to the existing items on there, and recognize that there's a new item for uh, uh, the Wapiti House that will come back at a later date. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Plott. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. I just wanted to confirm the date on the top uh, on item 1158 that it's January 1st, 2023. 
Um, I'm just wondering if there'll be any kind of updates next year as, as, as some mitigations happening on that site. Um, it just seems, just wondering if there'll be more conversations about it or if 2023 is when we're actually going to hear back about that. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, so the, right now that's a bit of a placeholder date. Uh, we'll be putting out an RFP for design of the work to be done on that slope and the trail, potential trail on that slope. Uh, sometime within the next few weeks, if well, actually, sorry, I should should restate, we're, we'll be awarding that uh, design uh, shortly on that. So there'll be work done on that, and after we have a sufficient amount of data on that, we can come back and check in with council if we have a, a decision point that uh, we would need council to weigh in on. Okay. Um, and thanks for that. I, I guess for me, I was I was actually hoping we'd have a conversation about the valid the validity of just not doing anything um, about it before we went to RFPs and looked at designing trails. Again, I walked that the, the other day and, and maybe maybe I'll have some people be mad at me saying this, but I, I'm fully in support of just closing that all down and not even putting another path in there at this point. I think we're going to create more damage by doing that. And I'm just hoping we're gonna have a conversation about that before we went to RFPs and, and looked at options. Cause I, I guess if the, one of the options that council wanted to approve was not doing anything with it, it would just save administration a lot of time and work and effort. You, or sorry, go ahead, Director Glover. Sure. Uh, so the the main work that would be done on that would be the slope stability uh, on the slope. Um, the trail is a consideration in that design, but it's not the primary reason for doing the work. It was to uh, stabilize the slope. Uh, so unless that unless councils, if councils questions more so on the slope than the trail, uh, then that would mat could materially change what we're doing. But if it's um, if the trail is secondary to that discussion. Um, then we would continue on with the work and uh, we may or may not build a trail and we could, that could be a decision point for council. Okay, and just, and, and thanks for that. Just to clarify that, I guess the trail impacts part of the slope stability in my opinion. If, whether we build it or not is gonna impact more potential erosion. I just was more wondering about a conversation about trail or no trail, I guess, to, to be honest on that and, and see if there was a conversation there. Appreciate that we have to do a stability report, but um, even the stability report, I'm sure, is going to come back and, and show us different things if we're building a trail or not in it. So it was just a comment for, for that. Great. Um, is there... Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, possibly, um, I apologize, Director Glavin, I may have asked this question earlier, but a motion may come out of it. So if you'll allow me, I have a question in regards to an, um, an update. I'm wondering if you can provide an update on uh, the noise mitigation on the combined heat and power unit behind the East Link Centre. Dr. Glavin. Sure, thank you, Chair Bressy. Um, so as I previously reported, although I did not update today, uh, that the skirting was in, uh, installed a few weeks ago on site. We're currently waiting for sound absorption uh, blankets that are going to be on the fencing to come in. Uh, once those are installed, we need to measure the sound again to see whether or not it's come into uh, compliance. That being said, am I incorrect? I thought I, I recall in our earlier conversation, we talked about putting a berm in and landscaping. Has that been done? Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, so neither of those have been done yet, depending on ultimately what, if so, for example, if the sound absorption blankets don't work, uh, we may need to do additional work that a berm could impede or the landscaping could impede. So we, uh, the current thinking is that we don't want to put those things in to have to rip them out shortly thereafter if we have to do anything more significant to attenuate the sound. Okay, and sorry, um, the sound in... Uh, Deafening blanket, uh, reduction blanket, uh, you, your expectation on installation is when? Uh, right now, we're uh, still waiting for materials to be shipped. Uh, they've been delayed multiple times, so we were expecting to have them by the end of August, then the middle of September, and uh, right now, we're, we're still not exactly sure when they're going to arrive. I've asked for an update. Okay, thank you. Great. Is anybody willing to make a motion to accept the... Mayor Clayton. Great. Uh, any discussion or debate? And I'll call that motion's question. In, In favor. favor. Great. And that motion carries. With that, I'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. I believe that Councillor Minhouse has the next meeting, but I'm not sure what the plan is in terms of lunch hour. Yeah, just um, we will take a break as close as possible to noon. So, um, uh, speaking with our CAO, we will go ahead with corporate services and then we'll take a break following that. So go ahead, Council. Oh, thank you. Sorry. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's remove the Cooperative Society <coughs> meeting. It's myself. Oh, okay. 